Let's do this. Get ready for the Dirt Life Show. Man, this is going to be an awesome episode of the Dirt Life Show. Thank you guys very much for joining me on this fabulous Monday night. Uh, we have episode 66 of the Dirt Life Show tonight. Man, it's just 66. I can't believe it. Uh, I'm Georgie Hamill. I'm your guys' host for tonight. So, again, thank you guys very much for joining us. Tonight show, we are live from Southern California with a uh, legendary off-road racer, all-around good, humble guy. Uh, his son actually rides a, a Razor now, drives a Razor off-road as well, but uh, just came back from second place at the Baja 1000. Many, many accomplishments, as you can see on the tables here in front of us, if you're watching the video. we got Rob McCacken joining us. How's it going, Rob? What's happening, George? Glad to be on the show. Yeah, thank you very much, man, and thank you for inviting us into this awesome shop that you guys got here. Yeah, um, you know, we spoke a few times recently, and I see you around. I check out your show once in a while, and i um, happy to have you guys here and, and uh, talk about racing. Yeah, and it's been good to talk with you. We uh, got to go eat a hamburger and have some, a little bit of fun, but it's really cool to understand, like, the mentality of all of us racers. Like, it's all the same, right? Whether you've been racing for uh, a very short time like your son has, or whether you've been racing for a long time like yourself. Like, all of these guys think the same. They have the same mindset. They just want to go out there and win a life, right? Absolutely. You know, I guess uh, for me, started racing off-road when I was 16, and uh, my dad raced uh, when I was in my single-digit age. And uh, when he, when I got involved, I fell in love with it. And, you know, once once you get hooked, you're, you know, you're all about it, wanting to work hard and wanting to win, and it's yeah. like an addiction. It totally is, right? And that happens with pretty much everybody, two wheels, four wheels, anybody that lives their dirt life. Um, so before we get started on our conversation, man, because we got a lot to talk about, it's going to be awesome tonight, um, I'd like to invite everybody to join us. You guys can always uh, visit us on uh, our live shows on Facebook and YouTube at any time, uh, 6 o'clock, Monday nights, and uh, come hang out with us, comment in. If you got any questions for Rob, you got any questions for myself, you got any even questions about what's going on with racing in general uh, in the new uh, 2021 season, uh, it'd be cool to have you guys join in we want to know what you guys have been up to if you guys have been doing any racing yourselves and you can always catch us uh in the archives on itunes you can catch us on spotify all of the different podcast networks and uh always on youtube and at the dirtlifeshow.com uh if you guys are more into instagram then uh, go to at the dirt life show and you can always follow at 21 rob mac as well and uh, go see all of his uh, good stuff he's got a bunch of cool content up there man and you can see uh back behind us over here he's got pictures of his uh, trophy truck online on as well um but this thing is still fresh off the track uh in baja man it's uh it's pretty cool to see i tell you <laughs> what man uh, and uh, so before we get into the conversation with Rob, we want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, we want to thank uh, Shock Therapy for coming on board. They've been a huge sponsor of the show ever since the beginning. So thank you very much, Justin, and the whole team over at Shock Therapy. We have a really cool show coming up uh, live at Shock Therapy with uh, a guy that you actually know, Todd LaDuke. Yep. Uh, so Todd's going to talk about monster truck racing and all kinds of fun stuff. And that'll be in two weeks over there at Shock Therapy. So uh, you can use the code DIRTLIFE at shocktherapist.com or you can give them a buzz anytime and uh, go save yourself a whole bunch of money. Tell them the Dirt Life sent you. Milo and JT and everybody up at the front of the shop is willing to help you guys out. Thank you very much uh, to the guys at Solder Weld. Thank you to, excuse me, the guys at Cryo Heat. The guys at Cryo Heat that do all the metal treatments, man, they do such a good job. They can do your CV joints. They can build pro mod transmissions for Polaris Razors with a whole bunch of less roll rolling resistance, and a ton of other cool stuff. So uh, give Josh over at Cryo Heat a call, and uh, he can help uh, yeah, make your car go faster, that's for sure. And uh, thank you very much to the guys over at uh, Wheel Pros, KMC, and EFX Tires. Rob obviously has uh, a couple different sponsors that we'll be talking about tonight, but thank you very much, Ryan and Ryan, over there for supporting the show. Uh, we really appreciate those guys. So if you guys ever need anything, feel free to give those guys uh, uh, a call or check out some of the stuff that they have going. Uh, we're also doing a KMC Wheels giveaway with uh, the Side-by-Side -side guys. So go and check out at the Side-by-Side -side guys and uh, on Instagram and enter to win some of those fantastic products that they have to fit your UTV. And, uh, yeah, man, thank you very much to all of you guys for joining us and having a good time with us. So, uh, man, I don't even know where to start with the questions, dude. <laughs> but let's uh, – we'll, we'll Tarantino this a little bit. We'll start by uh, talking about last uh, – well, last weekend you had a pretty big weekend. You went to the works races to support your son, but before that you were in Baja racing. Yeah, we um, – it's been a blur, really, last three weeks. Um, you know, went down to the Baja 1000 about – seven eight days before the race spent the whole time down there pre-running um we had a plan 
uh, to do two drivers. Josh Daniels drove with me. The plan was uh, for me to start, go to mile 422, have him get in, do about 320 miles, then me to get in and go to the finish. Um, you know, pre-running went great. Obviously, you know, score is always up in the game, making the track tough. And, Especially uh, in these crazy times, man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we, we had a hard time um, finding people to go down. Uh, luckily, I have a group of pit people called the Baja Fools. The Baja Fools? Yeah, the Baja <laughs> Fools. They, well, they've been around a long time, and uh, they, they pitted back in the Cowie days. They pitted with uh, Ivan, Stewart, uh, PPI. They pitted with Riviera, Herbst. And uh, for about the last, uh, since 2013, they've been pit with us. They're a group of anywhere between 50 and 70 people strong. And Dang, with really? COVID, yeah, with COVID, um, you know, some of them, you know, they have jobs and they couldn't get away. And ultimately, we were probably about 50% of a crew that we would normally have let alone um chase crews and and fuel guys so uh, man the the logistics and everything with thousand was very tough and very nerve-wracking for me it was good to to get out of vegas my hometown get down to baja and put all that away and get down and enjoy the the weather and pre-running and again like i was starting to say their score put an incredible course on 900 miles some of the tightest twistiest stuff we've ever had yep. um we speculated a 50 mile an hour average which would have put us at 18 hours for the win and ultimately it took uh, over 19 hours for luke to get that done so you know i think roger norman's score they keep trying to up the game and make it more difficult but um we went did that finished about 5 30 in the morning well before you talk about your next thing so during that race like did you guys have uh to adjust the plan during that race to kind of I don't know, meet the track's needs? Yeah, you know, you're always adapting, and that's the one of the big keys to success in, in racing in Baja is always being able to prepare, but prepare for what you'd never think would happen. Right. You know, and uh, luckily the experience that I've had down in Baja and then most of the people that I have that are going with me, they're veterans of being down there, so whenever something throws you for a loop, you're prepared and uh, for it and uh, can adapt and, and, and adjust to it. So we, fortunately... You know, I have a lot of good guys on the team, and whenever something happens like that, which it typically always does, um, we're able to adapt and, and conquer it and, and move on. Well, you were saying that there was a couple funny stories uh, that happened during the race, like uh, the uh, the pitch strategy, you guys had to adjust that. You uh, couldn't stop at one of the stops, so you had to adjust and, like, meet the truck at another stop. And all of those things are so phenomenal in my mind. I've never done a big race like that. So, you know, short course and stuff is completely different. But when I think about how you have to – well, you said 70 people, but you have to adjust a whole crew of people just to fit in that little, I don't know what you want to call it, a mistake or adjustment. It's phenomenal how yeah. fast people react and how good your team has to be. Yeah. L luckily, again, like I was saying, is I've been doing it a long time. I've got a lot of people have been doing it a long time. So, you know, when, when ultimately months before or even th I say preparing for the ball 1000 starts the year before yep. you're at the ball 1000 you're already preparing for the next year and uh as it gets closer to the race score releases a map and you get to see where the course is supposedly going and and ultimately there usually there's track changes as we get closer and um you know i i put a pit plan together before i go down to baja and then when i'm down there i'm adjusting it yep. changing it around and um you know this race it, it was you know i had i thought I knew where I was going to have my fuel pits and stuff. But when I went down there pre round I adjusted, moved people around. And, um, you know, we had a scenario. We had five pits, uh, fuel pits, and uh, pit one guys. There's about 15 in pit one. They were actually moving after I went through at mile 155. They moved over to mile 300. So they pitted me twice. Right. And then uh, we went over the uh, the pass through um, El Coyote, Melling Ranch area, came down to Valley to Trinidad, got to uh, Mike's Road about mile 442, we needed help, so BFG uh, allowed us to pit in within their pit area in their okay. semi, which allowed us to use their lights, their pit setup, and stuff like that. We used my guys. That's where Josh Daniel and Billy got in the truck, and then they went on to uh, do their section. They went about 160 miles. They were going to stop and pit at uh, when they came out of Matomi Wash, mm -hmm. and luckily my engine builder, Kevin Croyer and Brittany um, – it was Brittany Westoff, my co-writer's wife. Uh, they were chasing, and they ended up going. Nobody, th Not many people thought about this, but we started, and we went down the Pacific side, and then the race course went over the mountains inland and then down through San Felipe. But Kevin and, and I talked about what if they chased, and they went down through El Rosario and all the way down south towards uh, La Paz, right. basically, and took yep. the at Chapala. They came up through Cocos, and they went to pit three. My pit four, excuse me. When they got there, they realized they, there wasn't enough manpower there. And uh, they needed to figure out what they're going to do. They only had four guys there to do the fueling and, and everything on the truck. So um, at that time, they got 
they had no cell service. They went north up towards San Felipe till they could get cell service and ended up calling us and said, hey, we have a problem. So we adapted and started calling people. I had an airplane up in the morning with the, the Venable boys, Jason and Michael Venable. They flew di- during the daylight hours, but they landed in San Felipe and then went to the motel. Well, when we found out we needed people, I sent one of my chase trucks uh, through San Felipe, pick up Jason and Michael at the air, at the at the hotel and then haul butt south. And luckily... You know, everything happened, and we got about seven or eight more people commandeered to get to that pit that's to so make crazy. it happen. So that's something that was totally unprepared for. But during the race and having, uh, you know, people that were smart enough to figure out, hey, this is what we got to do, and then people taking it upon their own selves, you know, who's going who's gonna to be the tire guy? Who's going to be the fuel guy, and how do we do all this? But they pulled that off, and the pit actually happened in 40 seconds, which is that's a phenomenal. pretty damn good pit. So when you think about something like that, do you ever think about, like, how much uh – people know you and what your reactions would be and like how you would adapt to the situation. Like your guys said, okay, we're making these executive decisions. We're going to go do this because that's what Rob would do. And he'll just follow the plan. Yeah. Well, a lot of people, you know, they, they know, I always tell pretty much everyone that's on the team or associated with me, let it be me that makes the decision. Right. You know, so if you can reach out to me and, and put it on me, you come come to me with all your ideas. But, you know, ultimately, I, I, I hope for everyone to, to make it be my decision. That right. way, if it goes wrong, it's on me. Yep. It's not on them. And that's what Kevin Croyer did. He knew. He knows me well enough. We've had this discussion many times in racing, short course, desert, you know, come up with your best idea and let me make the call right. and let me be the guy. If it goes wrong, let it all fall on me. So he did that. And, and, uh, you know, other people that I have, Jimmy Davidson, you know, he went down as a volunteer and Chris Salazar, those are the two guys, yep. you know, they, they basically took those two guys took the bull by the horns. Once they found out they weren't supposed to be at the fuel pit, they were supposed to be chasing. Once they found out what was going on, they started making phone calls Step and in. making stuff happen and figure out how are we going to do this? And ultimately, you know, that's one of the best things about off road. Typically we all are a great big fan. Family. Yeah. We want to help out each other and so on and so forth. And we pulled it off. And that's that story. You know, there's a lot more to it, a lot more little details and funny things that happen. But um, that story is that's part of why we love racing in Baja. That's part of the memories and everything else. It's like but, they're an extension of you almost. Exactly. Like they do such a great job. Yeah. And, and at this whole time. Josh Daniels and Billy in the race truck, they had no idea this was happening. Anything, yeah. So they're going to a fuel pit that they thought was fully covered. Yep. And, um, you know, I, to the, I had never asked Josh, like, how did it go? Like, did you notice anything? But, um, yeah, Kevin Croyer ended up being the guy stopping the truck, and Jimmy was the left rear tire guy. And and uh, Jimmy wouldn't even let – he was concerned. Stuff those guys normally don't do. Yeah, yeah they don't do this. And, and Jimmy's uh, awesome, awesome help. And, uh, you know, he was so on top of it. And uh, he, he didn't even – he wanted to do the left rear tire, and then he wanted to run around the other side to make sure it got done right before the truck got left. So you he know, just left. checked it out? Yeah, so he went and checked it out. But, you know, the, these guys, it's – you know, they all have – my parents taught me when I was little when I first started racing, surround yourself with people that have passion like you do or, yep. or more. And Dude. typically, you know, that's, that's one thing that I've learned um, – you know, that's helped me be successful. That's actually a really good point to bring up. So if any of the kids are listening or watching, like it's really, really important that you surround yourself with people that are either good people or that have the same passion as you, like Rob just said, because that's going to make all of the stuff that you do for the rest of your life that much easier. Uh, we actually had a comment come in uh, that uh, Mike Gibson said, or Gilson said, does Rob think short course races should uh, be longer uh, and what does uh, what's the strangest place you've seen a kid come out to watch you practice? <laughs> Inside joke. So it sounds like he knows you, huh? Yeah, yeah, I know Mikey. Yeah, Mikey Gil- Gilson. Uh, we uh, named him the child of the corn. And, oh, really? <laughs> uh, the reason why that is, we were uh, in, I believe it was. Uh, this sounds like a good yeah, one. Yeah, 1997. <laughs> My first year racing with my own team back in the Midwest in the, the Soda Series, it was then, which turned into Core. Uh, we, uh, Johnny Greaves was um, good enough to let us use his shop. Oh, cool. And, and so we, we actually used Johnny's shop for five years wow. when we raced back there. And, um, you know, when our first year back there, we were struggling, had a brand new Pro 4, and uh, we were struggling with the truck. It was brand new right before we went to the first race. We had no test time. And after uh, first couple races, it's like, Johnny, we need to find a place to go test, and we need to test somewhere nearby. Johnny's shop was near Green Bay. 
And uh, so he made some phone calls, found some land about five miles away uh, in the cornfields. And uh, we went out there with the tractor and made a little couple jumps and basically called it a figure. It was a figure yeah. eight track. Just to in go get some. Yeah, in yeah. between the cornfields. And there was a little uh, area that water would run through so they really couldn't grow corn there so we were out there testing one day and we think we're in the middle of nowhere no one's around and um all of a sudden mikey the <laughs> child of the corn came walking out of the corn and he was i believe he was about 14 years old at that time and we're like where did this kid come from well just you shows know, up exactly so it ended up uh you know mikey ended up uh, volunteering with us and and started going to all the races with us and oh cool um, you know, his mom and dad were well. That let him go as as he was young. He was, you know, we traveled to Indy and and different races with him. Took him four or five, six hours on the road with us, and uh, had a lot of fun with him. So, and he, we just raced Crandon here in uh, Labor Day. Saw him and, again. Yep, he comes out every time we race back there. He comes out and helps out, volunteers, and um, see. I can't you know. say enough about how much that actually because we get p- people asking all the time. Even in fact, I had a, a Polaris test driver ask me, "How do I get in to help these teams?" Yeah. And that's the first thing you do. You volunteer. Yep, exactly. And you just come hang out because every single one of us or any racer needs help. Yep. So yep. you can come out to the teams. Uh, actually, Mikey also asked uh, any plans to get back into a Pro 4 again. I would like to see you get back into a Pro 4, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, um, sh- uh, two questions you had there. One, I didn't answer the, you know, short course races being longer. Um, you know, they're pretty darn intense. And then they also, are. you know, the wear and tear on the trucks is pretty amazing, actually. So um, when we race... Pro 2, for instance, and some of the, the tracks out on the West Coast, how rough they are, you know, we end up having to change a ring and pinion after, uh, you know, practice and then race at once, uh, you know, 15, 16 laps, so like that, we have to put a new ring and pinion in there. As far as Pro 4 goes, they're even more, uh, you know, labor intensive on keeping them on the track, so yeah. I don't know, maybe a little bit longer, you know, but I don't know too much would be a little you bit too much. You should probably but, uh, format that question to ask him at a race where he's in second and he almost caught the leader on the last lap. Then because, it needs to be yeah, longer. Then it, yeah, needs, then to it needs to be longer. Yeah. But if you're winning, it needs to be shorter. Yeah, yeah. I, I, when you're winning, the race seems really long. Yeah. And when you're losing, it seems really quick. So, yeah. And um, Pro 4, yeah, I love racing Pro 4. You know, those those trucks are badass. You know, um, some of the incredible things you can do with them. And, you know, one There's of the biggest things, like the them. most – you know, fascinating thing to me was when you'd actually, you know, I call it backing it into the corner. Yeah. You know, all-wheel drive truck doesn't like to turn very well. Yep. So you need to really throw them hard to get them turned, over-rotate them, and then stand on the gas. Yep. So they're, they're definitely fun. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to do that again. You know, short course um, in the Midwest looks like it's doing really good uh, with the core series back there happening. The the West Coast, it's, it's at a crossroads here with Lucas Oil you know, pulling out. So that's very concerning. And I really feel for the young kids. Um, you know, right now they don't really have a place to go. We'll, we'll see what develops. You and I were talking about a little bit earlier. Yep. You know, you got other series that are going works. UTVs look like maybe they're going to, you know, be a place to go for all these younger kids and all and, the trophy kids. Yeah. The trophy kids, you know, it's such a bummer. You know, you think about all the people, all the kids that started, um, you know, about 15 years ago that, you know, when they had an Avenue, racing with the core series out here on the West with Jim Baldwin, you know, the uh, RJ, you know, Anderson, Jarrett Brooks, all these kids, Sheldon Creed, you know, all those kids were trophy car kids and they yep. grew up and they look what they did. And, and now the feeder that Avenue, gone, the feeder, yeah. yeah, now it's gone. And, and the first thing when I heard, I started getting messages that, uh, you know, Lucas was going to shut the doors for off road. I was just like, the first thing I thought about was the kids. Yeah. And uh, it's a 100%. bummer, but hopefully um, somebody steps up and, and uh, fills the void. And, uh, you know, this is, I've learned a long time ago also, um, you know, this is opportunity. So, dude, yeah. It, you know, Big so time. hopefully, you know, um, I think so, a lot of these kids will go into UTVs and stuff. As we talk about this short course stuff, we actually have another camera angle in Rob Rob shop here. Um, you can see some of the stuff that Rob has over there. He also has a uh, – and if you're not uh, watching and you're listening on iTunes, you should go back and check out the uh, uh, the video either on YouTube or Facebook. But you can see some of the stuff that he has over here. Uh, in fact, he was just unloading some tires and stuff from, uh, from the Baja races, so he's got some BFGs over there. But uh, he has actually – Two Pro 2s over there and one Pro 4 or two Pro 4s yeah, so, and one Pro so, 2? Yeah, so there's actually two Pro 4s and, and, uh, and a, the Pro 2 we currently have raced, or the most recent one that we raced is on the, uh, as I'm looking at the monitor, it's on the far left with no body on it. That's the Pro 2. 
the truck in the middle with the Makita hood on it. That's the old Pro 4 that I used to race from 1997 to 2001. That truck's got some awesome yeah. stories, though, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's the truck that Mikey, Shiloh the Corns, that's the first truck that he came and saw oh, us really? racing in. So that truck there, Nye Frank and hey, Dave Hey, so Clark Mikey, built. if you're still watching, that thing probably looks familiar, huh, yeah. bud? <laughs> we got to bring that back out, right? Dude. And then uh, the one with uh, – Closest, Close to us. To us uh, that's the newest Pro Four that's been sitting there, and it's it's ready to go. I mean, we I don't know what to do with these things now. You know, joking. Um, we go to the sand dudes with these things. What do we do with them hey, now, man? If you so, want to film some cool social yeah. content, maybe it's not too bad of an idea. Yeah. See, see what what you can do to have some fun. I gotta admit though, like coming in the shop and seeing those things, it's really cool to see because a lot of uh, the reason that we started the Dirt Life Show is because we see everybody at the track, we see them on social media, and we think, oh well, I know Rob. I, you know, I know RJ Anderson, I know Kyle LeDuc, but we really don't, you know, like you have so much behind you and so much, uh, we'll call it humbleness and normalcy that the things that you do translate all into this racing stuff, your passion, everything that you do in your whole life. And it's really cool because a lot of the people that are watching the show have those same types of passions and the, the same type of understanding for all these different, uh, you know, race cars and all this stuff. So, um, Maybe you could share one of those stories with us about uh, uh, that uh, that truck. So, so the the old Pro Four uh, was built by Nye Frank and Dave Clark in uh, the end of 1996 for the 97 season, and um, you know it's an air shock truck. It has a uh, one air shock per corner. Um, it's got some rules that were designed or or, or made for it. Um, so you guys, a lot of you guys that race short course know about the 10 inch ride height rule that we have now. Yep. And actually that rule was instituted because of that truck. Um, when that truck was first built, it had about a seven inch ride height. And uh, after racing for three years on the fourth season, we ended up getting on a roll. Um, that truck won uh, 22 out of 36 races in the 2000 and 2001 season. That truck also won three Borg Warner First of all, that's a lot of completion of yeah. events, man. That's yep. awesome. Yeah, that, so that reliability was good on that. Absolutely. Thing too. You know, and it took us. It took us time. Uh, the first three years, we really struggled, and uh, you know, we had a lot of lot of teething pains with that truck. But once we got it dialed in, it, it got on a roll. It won three Borg Warner races uh, in a row back in Crandon, um, which now they it called the Amsoil Cup, and I'm not even sure what it's called now. But it it uh, it's the one and only truck that's ever won three of those in a row. But um. You know, that truck, uh, the 10-inch ride height rule um, was was because of that truck. It had about a 7-inch ride height, and people started complaining about it, saying it's too low, and, um, you know, we got a we got a ride height rule. And the ride height rule, uh, funny story, but when uh, Jimmy Johnson yep. raced Soda, the Herzog family commissioned Rod Millen to build him a Pro 2. And when they built the Pro 2, there was a track width that had to be 92 inches wide in the front, the outside of the tire, no yep. inches, no wider than 92 inches. Well, out here on the West Coast, to get around that, you ended up putting a lot of negative camber in the front. Because, because we of the measured, way that they would measure? Exactly, because they measure at the center line of the spindle. So at the center line of the spindle, you couldn't be any wider or 92. So when that truck got built, they took it back east. And the first time out at, I believe, Lake Geneva, yeah. they, the, the people back there in Soda Tech said, this truck's illegal. So... They said, you know, well, wow, to fix this thing brand new, it's going to cost a lot of money. You know, we, we're back here for the, the summer months, and we're, we're not planning on, you know, sending this thing back to fix it. So they ended up jacking the truck up to 10 inches to get that camera to go away. Yeah. So it measured legal. So it might be a little hard for somebody, some of the people to see, but uh, if you have a big screen, you might be able to see how those, uh, those tires are really have a lot of negative camera. Yeah. Yeah. So when that rule – was instituted in, I think, 96, 10-inch ride height rule, but it was a way to clarify the way it was stated. It said, track width will be measured at a 10-inch ride height. That's because they jacked Jimmy's truck up yeah. to 10 inches, and it was legal. So all the <laughs> way until 2000, it was just a way to measure track width. Well, in 2000, it somehow became a ride height rule. Yep. So my truck was not legal. It had already raced in 97, 98, 99, and it's part of 2000. And now we have a ride height rule. So chalk went up to one of the rules that, that was instituted because of something that I was associated with. But that's pretty cool though. You got to think, and there, I'm, there's, I'm sure there's many other rules that kind of follow that same suit, but uh, UTVs had those same rules yeah. come up over the past, you know, four or five years and all kinds of different stuff. But, um, I guess you could say you're trying to level out the competition, but we have this conversation with 90% of the racers that we talk with on the show is a rule book is made to be, how do you say it? 
studied to, to be studied <laughs> yeah to figure to be it out beat, to be beaten yeah uh, or whatever you say because a lot of the races can be won by a good rule book adjustment yeah you know however you're following the rules so it's pretty cool to see that and to see that truck have so much success behind the wheels of a great driver like you is rad that the rules came behind it like you got to feel a little bit good about that and uh, you know i mean no it is it is you know and i i appreciate it you know we're you know, I've associated my people with uh, with myself with a lot of people that are pretty innovative and they're always trying to figure out a better way. And uh, I, Frank, and Dave Clark were people that always tried to 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 do something with their hands in their yeah. mind to make stuff better. They yep. never really had a ton of money behind them to just do anything. So Nye and Dave would have to use their brains to figure out how to beat people. And uh, you know, I I. I, I like that too, and I study the rule book and I read the rule book and and try to figure out ways to to do what you can do. And um, we weren't you know, anywhere you, near the level of you guys because we were just racing little UTVs. But I had to have read that UTV rule book probably I don't know at least two hundred times trying to figure out better yeah. stuff. And it lay, makes you lay awake at night. You're like, man, how can I go faster? Yeah. What can yeah. I do? Um, we had a uh, Mikey Gilson commented back in since we were talking about him. Yeah, I miss that truck. I wish I could drive it. Can I come visit? <laughs> come out. We got some work for you to do here. The shop's the truck needs to be cleaned up after the thousand. Yeah, come exactly. on out. <laughs> uh, we got a bunch of uh, comments on Facebook, but uh, Parker James, uh, one of the best in the desert guys, uh, asked if there was any 2021 best in the desert plans. Uh, right now, um, you know, I my sponsors have pretty much aligned me with me. Um, you know, we're doing desert racing. Uh, we don't know if we'll do any short course racing in 2021. We love going to Crandon. Um, probably doing score stuff. Um, maybe best in desert here and there. Just really haven't laid everything right now. Just getting off the thousand and trying to figure out what we're doing next year. This has been, as you all know, a crazy year. Yeah. Um, and it's really even difficult to figure out what we're doing next year. Um, I, I do think it's cool that you have the opportunity to be able to figure it out and kind of um, adjust. Uh, you know, I've talked with a bunch of people before, including yourself, about uh, pivoting, I guess you could say, um, in the racing scene or whatever you want to do to make things go better for your program. And uh, you had even said this yourself. It's an opportunistic time. Yeah. I think that's a really, really true statement because if you position yourself properly, you have a phenomenal uh, – I don't know, lead or uh, edge on everybody. Yeah, you, you got to, you know, um, you got to adapt, right. you know, and, and through all my years of racing, you know, there's always been curveballs thrown at us and, uh, you know, different series changing, schedules changing, sponsors changing, and you always have to be ready to adapt. And, uh, you know, really, th this has been the most difficult time to figure out how to adapt, though. It really it, is. It has been. Um, this whole year, um, you know, for me and, and my team, you know, just figuring out what we're racing, you know, you have a plan, then the dates get postponed, then they get canceled and, and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, we ended up doing some different things. We weren't going to race Cran and we weren't going to race Vegas to Reno right. this year. And we ended up going to both those and we just had to adapt. And it's the same looking forward, you know, basically, you know, maybe you were headed this direction the last five years or whatever it is. And now the direction I think is going to change a little bit. So, you know, I'm, you know, I got a pretty good idea what we're doing next year. I got some some sponsor calls here to make in the next few days and talk to them and just try to feel everything out and see what, what is the best thing for us. Where's the best place for us to go, you know? And it's kind of cool, too, because you'll get, uh, I want to say, creative and uh, good feedback from them as well because they're going to tell you what they think is best, too. So they're going to give you a, an idea of if your pivot idea works good and, and stuff like that. And the reason that I talk about it so much is because there's so many people that are watching the show now, uh, young racers like we just talked about, um, I know one guy that was telling me about it. His name is Ryan Prosser. He's a new UTV guy. He races works. Um, and uh, he was talking to me about it at uh, dinner at the last works races. And he was saying, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do this. And it's cool for them to be able to hear uh, what a professional like yourself is, is going to be doing for 2021 because it'll give them motivation to understand that it's not going to be the same, but they can adjust and still achieve their goals. No, absolutely. You know, there's – I think that there's lots of opportunities out there. It's just going to find out where they are. Yep. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the worst thing, or I guess the Lucas Oil, that's the worst thing that happened. Right. But, you know, there's other places to go. You yep. know, um, 100%. We, exactly. You know, a lot of the, I feel for all these kids that were, you know, planning on going through Lucas Oil, people that were preparing to go do that. Um, you know, maybe there'll be a void. You know, there's definitely an opportunity. I've heard small rumors, nothing to myself of anything substantial, but small rumors about 
somebody trying to pick up the ropes and get some stuff going. Um, then you have other series works, you know, you got Azop, you got, um, you know, the, the, in the Midwest series, you know, they look, they're looking strong back yeah, there. Even with Texplex, is, Texplex. That's yeah. another one that I was going to say, um, man, that place sounds like it's good. I've never been, I know you have been there. Um, we definitely looked at it. My son, Caden, you know, racing works, plan on racing works again next year. And, um, Hey, you know, but so I know you have the uh, the family wagon that you took out to the <laughs> Warfighter made things. Uh, Dustin Jones uh, from Louisiana, he took out, uh, we'll call it the party wagon. He took out a uh, Can-Am X3 that he has. I know you're a Polaris guy, but he took out a Can-Am X3, had a full speaker system in it, put his buddy in it, put some monster energy in the back cooler, and he went out and raced it at Texas yeah, and perfect. had a great time, man. So maybe uh, you'll take Caden out there one of these days, and he'll go out there and race and uh, try to give those pros a, a run for their money, but you can take the family wagon yeah. and go out there and have some fun. <laughs> Absolutely. You should have a family wagon race class. Ooh, that would be cool. <laughs> I bet you Dustin Jones would be joining yeah. you. Uh, hey, so we had some other comments come in on Facebook, and it's looks like uh, uh, Mary, I think that's the way you pronounce it, Mary Duncan, uh, that says that's awesome. Way to go, Jimmy. So that sounds like maybe Jimmy was one of the ones that helped with the pit strategy in, uh, uh, yeah. down in Baja. And uh, Amber chimed in as well. Uh, and she said, uh, yeah, Jimmy Davidson made that pit happen. So, Absolutely. Uh, that's cool that you guys have that, uh, I don't know, same mentality. Everybody's just on point to try to think ahead. Yeah, and that's – I said it before, surround yourself with good, positive people that have passion and are like-minded. You know, these people have spent, uh, Jimmy and a lot of the people, they spend time around me, so they kind of know how I think, and they know my passion. So, you know, they Jimmy dug in deep and, and made it happen. So we were talking a little bit earlier, uh, and we might post some of this uh, content on social media when you give us a little bit of a rundown of the Baja truck about the seat pads that you have in there. And uh, one of my best buds, or two of my best buds, uh, Tim Hawley from UPR and Jeff Furrier from UPR, Tim just chimed in and he said, uh, for those uh, of us that think Rob is the GOAT, the greatest of all time, and uh, off-road, who do you think is the GOAT? Personally. Um, you know, I, I used to look up to, I, I still do, Larry Ragland, um, you know, when I got started racing, uh, I looked up to a guy named Jack Johnson, who's yeah. this year, he's getting uh, inducted into the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame. Uh, Jack was from Vegas, he raced motorcycles, he moved into racing buggies for Butch Dean out of Las Vegas, raced Butch Dean's house car, that was kind of a, uh, and it's where I moved into too, um, and uh, before me was Jack Johnson. Before Jack Johnson was Rolf Tivlin, yep. another moto guy. So, you know, Jack's someone that I looked up to. He taught me a lot about off-road racing, taught me how to read the desert. Um, and he battled with Larry Ragland. And, uh, you know, I had hopes. Like, Those hey, guys were bad Yeah, dudes, exactly. Man. So, you know, I'd, I'd go and, and watch, listen to Jack and, and watch him sometimes when I wasn't racing and watching him battle with Larry Ragland. And then uh, in the early 90s, when I went moved to a truck into the Ford Rofer Rotor pro program in 1991, I raced against Larry Raglan in Class 8. So um, he was someone I always looked up to, and now I'm racing against him. And uh, at that time, didn't even think I had the, the, the leg to stand on to compete with him. And then right. ultimately, um, within you know half a year or so, I was battling with him, and he and I were going at it. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Walker Evans as well, you know, somebody who's you know, I raced for in the late eighties and, and learned a lot from him. All right. Well, since um, Tim asked that question, I'll put you on the spot. Who's your Mount Rushmore of off road, man. It sounds like Larry would be well, Larry, there, huh? Larry, you know, there's, I guess there's bits and pieces, short course racing. You know, I looked up to Rod Millen. I yeah. watched him drive and, uh, he was just incredible. Dude, still to me this day, like just cause of uh, my injury and stuff, Evan Evans was a bad yeah. mofo, dude. Yeah. And, I, and Evan, when I raced at Walker's, I raced a seven S and Evan was there racing the class six. That's when he, he got hurt. So, um, you know, Evan was a bad dude. Um, you know, uh, Robbie Gordon, incredible. You know, yeah. we, we started out, actually, a lot of people don't know this, but um, I think it was 1986, uh, score HRA Rookie of the Year. It was between me, Robbie, and Cam Steele. Oh, really? So the three of us were up, and, and Robbie ended up winning that one. But um, it's kind of a joke between the three of us, and we laugh and giggle. But um, Yeah, because you, know, you guys are always like, you son of a gun, you yeah. took that from us. <laughs> yeah, well, Robbie was, I remember when he first started, he when he raced, I was already racing for a couple of years, and... Um, you know, when he showed up, and, and I'm like, damn, you know, first time out, they put him. I started in a 1600 car. Yep. Then I went to class 10. Then I went to class one. Well, Robbie went straight to class one, an uh, unlimited buggy. So I was impressed with how when he came in and he was 16 racing class one, yep. he hauled ass. Like, where'd this guy come from? That's cool, um, though. You know, I, I appreciate it's just like with sports. You know, I don't have a favorite team, but I like a good team. Yeah. You know, I like to see a good game. I like to see a good team. So I know, couldn't agree more, man. It, like, and uh, 
just a fanboy a little bit. I think if some of, because uh, I'm a little bit uh, of a younger generation or I don't know as much of the legacy of off-road, like some of the first uh, short course races that I went to were in roughly 2008 to 2010. Yep. And I didn't know anything but dirt bike racing until then. And so when I got there, uh, you as well as, uh, why am I forgetting his name right now? Uh, the Lucas truck. Uh, Carl. Yeah, Carl, yeah. Yep. And uh, so Renazetter, you, and uh, I think Wardy was racing yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, so, like, those were my Mount Rushmore to look after. You know what I mean? Like, your guys' names. Because I didn't know that uh, UTVs were going to start racing and stuff like that. And uh, Casey Curry gave me the opportunity to uh, test drive in his Pro Light. And then I just got hooked from there, yeah. man. And so, like, when I talk about the Mount Rushmore stuff and seeing you guys all Dyson on the track, especially in Pro 4s at the time, was like – phenomenal for me to look at it was like a kid in a candy story you know? yeah it was yeah. pretty cool um so abraham uh i don't know how to say his last name goulart asked uh rob i would be more than happy uh to help volunteer on any of your baja races this last year uh i saw you go through race mile 505 at uh morelia junction yeah morelia junction yep. yeah and uh morelia junction uh, I stayed at the hotel where you normally stay at, at the San Felipe 250, and they told me your chase guys had just left. Man, you just missed them, dude. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we could have used your help down there because we were missing people. <laughs> yeah, you just been right there, right? Uh, ooh, yeah, Jacob Imperial says uh, Pro 4 out in Glamis would be pretty sick. Yeah. You, you see any of those social media videos where those guys were hucking their UTVs at the uh, swing set? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it made me think I should have my have a short course truck out there. Yeah, just go big. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's probably what these short course trucks are for now is Glamis. They're, they're not Pro 4s anymore. They're Glamis trucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and John uh, commented in and said, you work in the area, not in the rule book, just like NASCAR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that is, uh, yeah. And Brian Forrester commented in and said, "Serious talent. What's up, Brian? He's a good friend of mine too." So, um, is uh, yeah. And uh, Brian Hawkins commented in as well. Man, we're getting a lot of comments coming in already today. Uh, this episode, he's like a kid in a candy store watching all this stuff. So I don't know uh, when you logged on, Brian, but we'll just give you a little sneak peek of the uh, uh, Pro Four and Pro Two and the short course trucks over there. Uh, we got the uh, Baja truck sitting right behind us or the trophy truck sitting right behind us, but he's got some pretty cool stuff in the shop, man. So we're lucky to be here and uh, we're lucky to have Rob invited us over to hang out for the night. Uh, so going back to what we were talking about, about uh, works racing and what you did over, well, last weekend. Uh, you got done racing the Baja. You placed second, so congratulations to you and your team. That's awesome. Uh, these aren't the trophies from that race, but uh, these are some of the most memorable trophies that you have, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Lechero preps his truck here, and back behind the truck, he's got a little area with all his favorite trophies, and yeah. there's there's uh, the 2014, 15, and 16 Baja 1000 overall trophies, and this is one of those, and he's got the Mint 400 stuff back there and a few other things. This is, um, this thing's pretty cool. You guys can't see it, but this sucker is so heavy, man. It's like <laughs> solid metal, man. It's super, super cool. What a cool trophy to have, though. Yep. And it was the 48th, so that's three years ago? Yeah, four, I think four so. Four years ago? Yeah. That so, was probably, well, it's either uh, 14, 15, or 16. So we haven't got one since. We've got a couple seconds since then, and uh, we'd love to get, you know, there's no feeling for me in all of my racing, the feeling that you get when you win the Ball 1000 overall is yeah. something like nothing else that happens. And uh, we were close this year, about 11 minutes down to Luke at the finish line, but, um, you know, still. Were there times during the, during the event when you uh, – when you thought either you really had the chance to go through it or you thought like, God, we just got to keep catching up. We got to keep catching up because there's those races, right? That you're like, I'm on fire. I got this, like no problem. And then there's those other races. You're like, like we just talked about, like I need a little bit more time. Like I'm inching, inching up. Like what did you feel like during this last race? Yeah. So this, this uh, year's race, we started sixth. Right. Um, you know, I, I felt we had a great starting position and uh, we kind of got held up um the first 155 miles, we lost about four to five minutes to the lead four guys. Um, but that's okay. You know, it's still 900-mile race. I knew it was going to be difficult. Plenty Very of time. Plenty of time. It's okay. Um, and we got clear of the guy fifth on the road and uh, started trying to catch back up and um, ended up having a slow leaker. Um, didn't lose any positions. Changed a tire in a little, little over a minute, which was really good. Didn't lose any position. Then just started trying to work our way up. And right before... Um, you know, our second pit, mile 300, uh, we started getting dust again, started yeah. catching some dust. And uh, about that time, from mile 300 over through uh, 
Melling Ranch, El Coyote, and down over to Trinidad, the sun went down, and now we were in heavy dust, yeah. and that was the, the number 70 truck, and then in front of him was the 19 truck, and I just felt we were going way too slow, like, this is this is not good. Dust was hanging really, really bad, and no I could breeze. kept seeing the lights every time, we, you know, it was very mountainous in there, and you could see the trucks every once in a while, I could tell there was two of them, and I'm just like, we got, we need to be going faster, because yeah, like I, I didn't feel good gas. about this, yeah. and by the time we got to the other side, and I got out of the truck at four mile 422, we were almost 15 minutes down now uh, to uh, the first truck on the road and about 12 minutes down to the third truck on the road. And we were fourth on the road now because both those trucks that were in front of me, the 70 and 19, had small problems and it was it enabled us to get by them. But we were down 15 minutes about when uh, Josh got in and then he hauled butt, had no problems on the whole San Felipe loop, um, you know, gave me the truck back um, at mile 740 and basically had a run as hard as we could to the finish but there's a lot of there's a lot of technical stuff in there corridor molina tied uphill canyon very very rocky so i was trying to push in there but i go man if i have a flat that's going to drop me back yeah, so it's too risky right Right. we tried to be patient get up through there and just try to keep making time and you know um when we got to about 80 miles uh k77 80 miles from the finish you know we gained a little bit of time but not enough so we yeah. really went for it then but at the same time knowing after the race um Alan and Pudi had got back in the truck mm -hmm. there and uh, he wanted to win. And Luke, Luke had him by some amount of time. So Aaron went balls to the walls yep. trying to catch up because it was win or nothing. Yep. I did the same thing. And Luke figured in hindsight, him telling me at the finish line, Luke thought the same thing. He said, I got to go because I know these guys are coming. Yeah. So Luke told me from K77 to Ojos, that 40 miles in there, he drove like he, he was, was qualifying. Just full wood. Yeah, he was wooden it. So Dang. in that section, Ampudi ended up crashing, um, ripping the front bumper off and oil coolers and stuff like that. So we, we were able to get in front of him, which gave us second place. And at the line, we, were, we lost by about 11 minutes. And, yeah. um, and I remember we actually interviewed Alan on the show uh, a while back and he told me, he's like, these, these new desert race, well, the latest desert racing years, it's like winter die trying kind of thing. Yeah. Like you, it's seconds or minutes. Like it's yeah. so close that you almost don't have the opportunity to slow down. Like what no. you're saying, you just have to go full tilt. E ever since we started qualifying for the races, and now the fastest guys are starting in the front, the pace like elevated 10 or 15% just because oh. of that. So when we first started qualifying, and let's just say that first race, I don't know where I qualified, not first, okay? Yeah. And I'm back somewhere. And the race starts, we go 30 miles, 50 miles, and, and I'm hauling ass, and I'm, lo I'm losing time. And I say to myself, and I want to tell everyone, slow down. Yeah. We're going too fast. This <laughs> is good. Break, yeah. We're not going to make it. But, <laughs> you know, some of the, the younger guys, the new guys that came on board, you know, they didn't have the history that I did when I had to deal with, you got to save your brakes. You yep. got to save the transmission. You got to save the tires. Yep. In these new new times, the technology and the equipment has become so much more reliable that you can actually push them hard. Yeah. So, and as time goes, it keeps getting better and better and better. BFG keeps making a better and better tire. And, you know, they're, they go 200 miles. I remember in the early, early uh, 90s, class eight days, you had to take care of your tires. You could make them bald in 30 miles on well, the we crossover We were actually road. talking about this a little bit before the show, too, because uh, you showed us actually, um, I think you showed us some of the tires that are over there by the short course trucks that uh, these are BFG 40-inch tires. Yep. And... They're so lightweight. It's crazy. Yeah. But you said they're building them lighter. Well, I guess lighter, stronger, faster. It's a kind of a cliche, yeah. but it really is. Like No, it, it's true. And, and, then, and I asked, like, how are you building a tire lighter that makes more grip and yet it's stronger? Well, it's technology. New yeah. materials have come out, and they're able to make tires with better material. It ends up being lighter. And all it trickles down to all that. Like, and as we talk about this all the time, how much uh, the racing uh, portion of off-road – trickles down into us trail riders and yeah. uh, people that are going to the dunes and all these different things because all of these performance enhancements and technology are developed from racing. So all of the yeah. stuff that you're doing out on the track trickles down to all the stuff that people can put on their cars. Absolutely. Man. It's not tires, not just tires. Yeah. It's shocks. It's yep. the transmission parts. It's, it's everything in that truck. Uh, wheels. You Do know, you have those uh, uh, electronically controlled shocks on any of your razors? Uh, I do not. Yeah, but have you seen those? Though? Yeah, actually, yeah, actually, I have. I've I've driven. I don't have them on mine, but I've driven them on razors. And then, uh, you know, Fox is always pushing the envelope, and they're yeah. actually they're starting to do that stuff on trophy trucks now. Oh, really? Are um, you getting some of the well, technology I, here? I, I don't have it yet. I've tested with it. Um, Fox owns a trophy truck, and I've done some driving with them for testing. And also, Justin Lofton. Um, 
he he used it at uh, the Ball 500, and he also used it at the Blue Water, and he won at the Blue Water with it. So that that technology um, is being instituted into trophy trucks. That you know, it's stuff that came from the Razor on the Raptor. Yeah, uh, going in a trophy truck. Now, obviously, a trophy truck has a lot more wheel travel. The shock speeds are a lot faster than a, than a, especially a Raptor typically and uh utv is not quite as fast but right uh, when you have more moving pieces yeah, stuff, yeah just the wheel travel you know 30 something inches of wheel travel and the shocks yeah. the shaft speed that's getting there um i'm sure the the utvs are similar but probably not as great especially yeah i don't weight, think there would be anywhere close yeah. but yeah i totally get it i mean it's just so cool that to see all this technology come trickle down and utvs wouldn't be anywhere near what they are today unless stuff like this had trickled down um so we had a couple more comments come in uh so really where do you stop for, for bathroom breaks during the Baja 1000? Have you ever got this question? Because we get it all the time oh, yeah. on the show. We got it for Sarah Price's show, too. And she <laughs> yeah. was like, no, we, we don't. <laughs> well, we, we wear, I wear a catheter. So, um, well, Sarah doesn't wear anything. No, and, and I feel for her. Um, she uses a little bit of baby powder yeah. at the end. <laughs> yeah, I, um, you know, I didn't used to wear a catheter until about 2010, and I ended up I would dehydrate myself honestly. Yeah. Or if we had a, I would because you if, don't want to take a piss. No, right? you yeah. don't want to. And uh, you know, I, I honestly I couldn't. You know, yeah. it's like I couldn't even pee, but I would dehydrate myself, and then I would feel it at the end of the race. And I never really knew it until about 2010. I started wearing a catheter, yeah. and I couldn't pee in it. But one time going over the summit on the bottom side in the wash I got a flat yep. and I had to pee really bad from the start line so for almost two hours I had to pee yep. well the first time I ever was able to do it was when I had a flat tire and I was able to relax since then it's been a piece of cake so um you know ultimately I, I'd say you know this last ball 1000 I, I probably I peed a lot yeah. you know and we have a drinker system on the truck yep. it's got about a two gallon reservoir little it's got an electric little system. pump yeah. and I push the bu- have a hose and I push a button yep. so I'm constantly drinking because I realize now how important it is to stay hydrated absolutely so well, catheter some, is key <laughs> yeah 100 percent. and I learned that too in my one of my first desert races as well and uh, fortunately, I didn't have the the, the stage fright, um, yeah. so I was just able to go. And I was like, "Geez, this is awesome! Yeah. Like, this is perfect." No, one right? of the best things ever. Yeah, <laughs> one of the best things ever. Uh, but that cold water thing is actually sounds like it's pretty cool. Yeah, the little drinking system. Yep, absolutely. Does it last the whole race, or they got to refill? Uh, so every fuel pit that we stop at, they they refill the water, so we never run out. So. Yeah, and uh, Jacob says you don't stop for <laughs> restroom breaks. Yeah, <laughs> you don't, man. So you just keep going as fast as you can go because that's uh, what everybody else is going to be doing too. So maybe that's one of the the best inventions is having to not stop for pee breaks, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's key key to success. All right, so we uh, uh, we keep going like on an off on little different side subjects, but. So you, uh, you and your team did phenomenal at the race. Just to finish a Baja 1000, just to finish a San Felipe 250, any of those races is a phenomenal achievement, right? But uh, you finished second at the Baja 1000. Um, you had a bunch of people down there. Did you have any time to uh, reminisce or, or thank everybody, or did you just come straight back to the States to come? Uh, yeah, no, um, we just came right back. Um, we finished about 5.30 in the morning. There's a little bit of sun in the sky. We did some interviews, stuff like that. They wouldn't, because of COVID, they wouldn't let the team. I, I really feel for Luke McMillan, and, and he mentioned it to me. Um, you know, he, here he is winning his first ball 1,000, yeah. and uh, finish line was out in the middle of nowhere. You know, there was no locals, no spectators. They only allowed very few of our own people in there. So his celebration was was pretty minimal. And, uh, you know, I feel for him, but, um, you know, still, I, I'd, been, I'd, I'd love to be the winner of that race. But, yeah. you know, um, Kind of a bummer, but we, we went back to, you know, and everyone knew that they couldn't come to the finish line, so a lot of them all went back to their, I had people in three different hotels in Ensenada, a couple rental houses, stuff like that, people stayed in San Felipe, um, you know, most, when I got back to the hotel, most everybody was either gone, headed home already, yeah. or already uh, in, in bed, so, um, you know, Cade, my son, was racing works that same weekend in Prim, so um, I didn't know for sure how soon or how how I would feel yeah, how you could to head back. home. So, you know, once that sun came up, I was wide awake and we went back to the hotel, loaded stuff up and I started check on everyone, see how they're doing. See yeah, we talked about go. it, like technology has gotten so much better. I'm sure your phone wouldn't stop. Yeah, so we ended up packing up and uh, drove straight from Ensenada home to Vegas, got home about 7.30 or so Saturday night and then Sunday morning got up, went back out and 
and help Caden. Yeah, went down to Pram where the side-by-side yep. -side world finals, we were over there too. So that was actually the first time uh, that I got to, and I never met your son, Caden. I wasn't able to because we were so busy, but that was the first time I got to ever see him drive. And I told you uh, when we were uh, showing up the shop earlier today that it was really cool for me because I didn't know who he was. I had no, I just saw, uh, you know, the, the Black Razor, I called it. And I was like, man, this kid is driving like a, a, a really good driver, right? And, uh, you know, I heard him then call his name out and I said wow I didn't know that that was Rob's son and I really honestly had no idea that he was at that level of racing so you gotta be pretty proud yeah absolutely it's it's only his second year racing last year was his first in the works and he just raced uh in the in the stock 1000 class last year this year he raced both the 1000 productions RS1 right yep RS1 um this year he raced 1000 production and 1000 stock ended up winning uh I think he won 13 races total this year two seconds and really? ninth and 11th yep won the championship in both and uh and then on Sunday, he, this Sunday, right after the, the thousand, when I got home, he ended up racing three t three times because after he clinched both the championships, he was able to enter the pro race. So he wanted to see where he fitted with the uh, with the uh, pros, and he was ended up in the turbo class, and he's in a non turbo right. car. So they outpowered him quite a bit. Um, but he, anyways, he got his feet wet in there, and next year he'll be moving to the pro classes. And uh, you know, he's definitely driving smooth and consistent. He preps his own car. And uh, you know that's one of the keys to winning championships is not having any failures. And this year he had he had no, no failures at all. Yeah, one hundred percent. Well, we had uh, Amber chimed in and said uh, Rob learned the importance of hydration when he was so dehydrated, almost pa passed out of the race. Yeah. And you know what the the crazy part about that is is. I don't think that that's a, a statement that should be taken lightly. When we were at uh, 2017 at the uh, Lucas Off-Road Race in uh, Wheatland, Missouri, yeah, there was guys dropping like flies. I mean, and they're fit little kids, 16, yep. 17, 18 years old. Some of them were just fat passing yep. out because they were so dehydrated. So um, me, for instance, like I had uh, electrolytes and waters and all kinds of stuff, and I would make sure that on a timely manner, like almost uh, you know every couple hours, that we were giving all of our crew members – all the stuff to make sure that they stay hydrated. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like Amber is, is on your guys' case yeah, yeah, about yeah. making sure that you guys are too. Yeah, when I raced a uh, 1600 car, um, probably 2010, Barstow, night race, and uh, ended up having a chance to win overall. We were leading overall starting the last lap in a 1600 car there. But um, I had I was always concerned about weight, and yeah. I, I carried no water, no nothing, and uh, ended up stopping on the last lap to get water. But I got two bottles of water, and they're freezing cold, and I just slammed both of them. Well, the last lap, I ended up falling apart. Shock your body. Shouldn't have done that yeah. yet. And uh, when I got to the finish line, um, you know, shut the car off and got out, and I was standing there, and I'm like, I started feeling dizzy, and I yeah. realized, you know, what I'd done, and ever since then, I'm like, you know, I can't do that, and, yeah. uh, you know, for me... Pay attention to your body. Exactly, kind of I mean, yeah. and you you can't, you know, a lot of people, they start right before the race, and you you got to start weeks long yeah. time and and ultimately like i i'm my kids the kids all laugh because i'm constantly telling them drink water yeah. you know when i to me saying hello, hello to them is the same thing as a lot of times i just say drink water and they <laughs> laugh and they're like shut up <laughs> shut up but they they we we go through so much water at the house and and um but uh, for me like this ball 1000 i got out and i'm not sore at all you know yeah. i i'm even as i'm driving home i'm like wow like I'm fine, yep. and I, I attribute a lot of that to, one, doing it a lot, you know, and getting the right muscles, you know, that are prepped, helmet, weight, neck. It's all it's all used to it, but right. drinking water, you know, I what I do is I start drinking Pedialyte, you know, for this way ball 1,000, way ahead, probably two weeks before, yep. Pedialyte, water, Pedialyte, water. And, and so there's some racers that actually do uh, IVs yep. pre I've done that as well prior too. and post as well, and um, me being such a, like, I, I love fitness stuff, so yep. um, I've competed in Ironman before and done a lot of endurance activities and things like that, and uh, I know firsthand that the hydration portion of it, I mean, like, we would start weeks and months before making sure that your body had the right levels yep. of hydration and even drinking stuff like alkaline water and all this stuff it makes a huge difference but um i do think it's kind of funny that the kids are <laughs> like <laughs> yeah don't tell me what to do yeah it's it's pretty neat that you guys are actually out there doing it though i'm glad that amber's actually on that we'll call it the health tip yep. too right so she keeps you guys in, in line absolutely <laughs> um let's see here we got we had a couple more questions come in as well so uh are you still going to race short course? I think if you get the opportunity, you're going to take that Pro 4 and go show some dudes what's up. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's definitely, said a couple times, um, the Midwest Series, the Core Series back there, 
um, you know, they're they're looking good back there. They've got a, a new group there that, um, you know, has definitely got a lot of passion, and they've got some good people on board. Do you know some of those people that are running that organization? Well, um, you know, uh, so – I've never met him, but there's a, a guy, Carl, and I'm not sure I'm going to say his last name, Carl Shabitsky. Um, you know, he's part of the Snowcross, and if you guys have seen Snowcross on TV, yeah. and it's the same same guy, same group, um, they're the ones that are running the Midwest Series back there. That, that's who owns it. Um, they've hired uh, some pretty good people. Frank D'Angelo's on, on staff back there. That's and, the series that Johnny Greaves kind of yep, helps promote. And- yep, Johnny, Johnny. There's a lot of good people back there. Johnny, Jeff Kincaid, you know, a lot of good input, and... Um, you I know, know they get decent truck turnouts, but they get phenomenal UTV turnouts. Yeah, and, and spectators, too. That's another thing. You know, they, they get a lot of people, Cran and Bark River, ERX, um, you know, great, great spectator fan base back there. And that's why I love going to Cran so much, um, you know, because they're, they're fanatics back there. They, they know history about the racing. They've been around, you know, people uh, – it's my – you hear – you, it never goes out without notice that you got people that say, hey, this is my 25th consecutive Crandon race. Really? And stuff like that. So you got fanatics. And they travel from around the country. So you Alfonso know. and I have never been able to go out there, and uh, I think that's on our bucket list for sure. You like, should definitely go. In, anyone, um, definitely go to Fall Crandon. Check it out. Um, again, you know, I think there's big things in Crandon. You got There's some new news that came out. Jamie Flannery now owns the Crandon track. The oh, Flannery, I heard that. The Flannery family's always been a big part of it, and now uh, Jamie's taken over. Jamie's uh, been doing real well with his companies and his businesses Sweet. and he's he's wanting to grow Crandon so I think there's good stuff going back there and um for me racing short course you know I I got plenty of short course trucks here to race yep. um so if it fits in the schedule I, I imagine here before the end of the year we'll we'll you know within obviously another week or two we'll figure out what we're doing next year and and what we're doing um and and maybe there'll be short course involved there too. Yeah, it'll be really cool. And I know, like as far as what you guys are thinking, like God, it would be awesome to see Rob out there. I'm on the same boat as you. I know Alfonso's in the same boat, so we would all love to see him out there. Um, oh, here's a good question. Uh, and maybe we should ask your son this. Actually, um, Kevin McCullough says, "Will Caden be driving the trophy truck any in 2021?" <laughs> well, he drove he drove Vegas to Reno. He got the last 90 miles in, and he he did pretty good. Um, you know, at this point... Um, Did he have any competition that was running him down or anything? Well, yeah, we talked about that a little bit earlier. So uh, about 100 miles from the finish line, we ended up... I missed a G out, hit it pretty hard, um, knocked the wind out of me and, and hurt my back. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't... It was... it was The bumps uh, were shaking my back and it was hurting. And I'm like, man, I started thinking to myself, what am I going to do? This really hurts and I'm going slow. And I think Caden can go faster than I'm going. And so I thought all this to myself, and I, I said to Caden, I go, uh, you ready? You're going to drive. And he goes, I can't drive. And I go, you can go faster than I'm going, so <laughs> you're driving. And he said, well, who's going to ride? And I said, Lachero, the crew chief, I'll call yeah. him, tell him to get ready. He'll get in with you. But I never told him when it, anyone at the pit that I was the one getting out, so I think they all thought Caden was getting out and Lachero was going to get in. So when we pulled in and stopped, I got out, Caden got in, Lachero got in, and they took off. Um, about that time, I see the truck going away. I limp over towards the chase truck, and uh, the number 38 Husted truck came through about 30 seconds behind Caden. I'm like, oh, no. You know, now I, you know, somebody's on his butt, and yeah. I got to tell him. So I start walking to the truck to, to radio to him to say, hey, you got a trophy truck on him, and I'm on you. And uh, I decide, nah, he'll be fine. Let it go. He'll <laughs> figure it out. Back. They got a mirror. <laughs> so about – a minute later, Andy McMillan comes through, and I'm like, oh, shit. Hey, real quick, how old is Caden? So Caden just turned 18. There you go. Okay. So, so for everybody that's out there. Yeah, about a minute later, Andy came through, and I'm like, oh, shit. Now I really need to tell Caden. <laughs> and I went, and I thought to myself, and I'm like. And Vegas Arena is not an easy race. No, it's it's high speed. And, and the section when he got in, it, the next 30 miles was high speed. And then after you went through weeks, it got tighter and twistier and very rocky, as everyone knows, coming into the finish. And, um. You know, as Andy went by, I said, well, I better go tell him. And I go, ah, he'll figure it out. He'll be fine. So um, I got to the finish line. I'm sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. And pretty soon, Caden, you know, a lot of you guys have seen the videos at the finish line of Vegas Torino. It's a rolling hill, and people send it off that. And as I'm sitting there, and um, all of a sudden, here comes Caden over the hill, and he kind of sends it. And I'm like, oh, shit, how did he know? <laughs> like, he didn't never been here before. And I realized he's watched videos. Yeah. He knows. Social media tells yeah, him what to do. He, he knew. <laughs> Vegas to Reno over the finish line. It's straight. Air it out. So he airs it out. And I'm like, damn, where's Andy? And about a minute later, Andy goes through. And I'm like, 
Wow. So, anyways, Caden did pretty damn good. I know it was dusty. That's the whole um, dad thing, right? You want to go ahead and like, hey, I'll warn my son. To, and no, I'll let him go. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, right now, you know, Caden's moving up to the pro class and works. We don't know what our schedule is. It'd be great if he could ride with me. And we had hoped that he was going to ride with me at the Ball 1000. Yeah. But he had work scheduled the same weekend, so we wasn't able to do that. So, we'd like to get him some more riding time and and then more more seat time in the Razors. I know he wants to jump right in that trophy truck and oh, I'm sure. skip right to the top. So. Yeah, who wouldn't like to jump in a trophy <laughs> truck, right? But, uh, yeah, that would be pretty cool, Kevin, to see uh, to see him drive a trophy truck. I, when I watched Caden at those races, man, he was really actually wheeling those cars pretty good. Uh, Jim Zinn asks, well, what's your favorite American food? Uh, American food. Oh, American fast food, he said. Fast food? Uh so I know Jimbo. This might oh, be a trick do? question. I'm trying to think. He's, he's oh, is he trying, trying to, to give you a secret? I don't know. Like he a, try, might try to be reminding me of something. Is this like an inside scoop yeah, kind maybe, of thing? Maybe, maybe. Hey, uh, well, I'll answer this one f- for <laughs> myself then. So, Jim, my favorite food is tacos. But if I have to, if I ultimately have to, I do like Jack in the Box tacos. They're like they're the the last on the taco list. But yeah, especially compared to Baja, right? Yeah. Wait, maybe he's saying that because he knows that how good the tacos are down there in Baja. Yeah. Yeah. So he's trying to get us. Uh, uh, hi, Amber Malloy. Hi, Robin McCachran. And that came from Jeff uh, Lothringer, I think he yep. pronounced it. Jeff's, Jeff's one of our chase guys. Oh, right on. Yeah. So Jeff did a heck of a job down there. He did him and his group. I always call him. Uh, we have the Jeff Lothringer group, which I he's like the main guy for three or four chase trucks. And I always work with Jeff, and then he works with the, the other guys. But Jeff uh, Jeff and his two other chase trucks, they did they took care of the Pacific side for us. Oh, cool. And they chased um, you know up and down uh, Highway 1, and then Jeff ended up having the lucky task of using Santelmo Road, which goes up to Melling Ranch and El Coyote. Mm-hmm. And if, any, if you don't know what Santelmo Road is, it's a very twisty, tight, narrow road that seems like it goes on Real forever. Skinny. Very skinny, very, very sketchy, and a lot of stuff so jeff ends up getting sent up to the most difficult places with his group so Wait, so when you when you're doing all these things uh these well, i don't know what you want to call it strategy for the pits and for the chasing are there straws short straws long straws uh, like who, or do you just position people where they you think they're going to be good at well i i pretty much you know as jeff's the, the the lead in that group and i got a lot of faith and trust in him i usually give him the most difficult yeah. side of his group and then i have another group of three or four chase trucks that i call the tony barraza group oh. or tony has tbd designs but tony's been around helping us for a long time been off in off-roading so tony gets the difficult sections in the other side so oh. usually he's the guy you know um that that place that's way far out there that's so down the rough dirty road best. exactly so i t- always send tony in there i gave him a task that was a uh, almost an impossible one this time and it was uh to send him in to the top of corridor molina which the access road i don't even know how might have been 30 miles in and i don't even know if it was passable really I said, tony just try to go there figure it and, out uh, figure it out and, and that was his last spot that he had to hit but um he had two other chase trucks and they did everything down by San Felipe. Nice. Um, so they, they all hit two or three spots. I each. always think about it. Like, I'm like, I would just like to go down there and chase. I mean, racing would be cool, obviously, but going down there and chasing seems like it'd be a hell of a lot of no, fun. No, absolutely. Too. And, um, you know, for me, you talked about strategy a little bit. And, you know, like I said, it starts. 365 days in advance and then when the map comes out and it continually goes and I have to figure out you know how many chase trucks do I have who are they where are they going you know where did I send them last time because sometimes I'll switch if if the Lothringer group's on the Pacific side this time and maybe I'll switch them next time so they get to see stuff different but um it's a whole thought process planning can they make it but it probably gets easier when you understand the team that you have yeah it does and that's why these guys have been with us for a long time and and uh they, they want to win just as bad as we do. Jeff is always, you know, it, not only Jeff, but other people are always putting their two cents in trying to help me figure out um, strategies to win and, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, Mike Gilson chimed in. Man, he's jumping all over the place. He was on YouTube for a little bit. Now he's on Facebook. But uh, he says that we, he hopes you and uh, – well, he's talking to Amber, but hopes you and Rob uh, and the family have a great Christmas and New Year. So, yeah, we want to say that to everybody else, too, that's watching Rob's show uh, to have a great uh, – Christmas and New Year's too, because everybody's uh, going to be able to spend a little bit more time with their family. Uh, Robert Blanton gave you the hang loose sign too. Right on, Robert. Yeah, it's good to see you, Rob. Thank you very much for chiming in. Uh, Don Haugen, he has a a son that races in the Pro Turbo class in short course with Lucas, but uh, so they're probably going to have to find uh, another avenue to race. Yeah. But he says, Rob, do you think short course series will ever come back in the Southwest? Well, I certainly hope so. I think you know this is an opportunity. You know. Um, I think we all know with Lucas Oil, 
you know, I don't know. It just seemed like it was getting maybe a little bit stale or something. There just need to be some change there. Maybe this is that opportunity for change. Hopefully someone steps up or a new entity steps up and uh, gets, gets short course racing going on, going again out here. Um, there's also hope that the Midwest group guys, you know, that they, they end up moving out this way more. And, uh, right. you know, we always talked and I, I never really, I never really supported it too much that, you know, when we had two series, we had the, the West and the Midwest, that it should always be one. Right. I, I never thought so much that it needed to be that way. I think uh, short course racing and most off-road racing, it's kind of, it really is regional. It works for you, um, you know, and the people in the Midwest. And I, this is an analogy that I would always use. If the West series went away, which it has now, how many of these people that race here will go race the Midwest series? Right. And to me, I believe it's for sure less than 20% of them. Oh, I wouldn't because it just doesn't work. All. Right. I mean, I don't think it's very much at all. And likewise, if the Midwest series went away, how many of those would come out here and race? Probably so, about the same. Yeah. So with that being said, what's wrong with two series? Right. Just saying. Now, I know there's arguments both ways. Well, and but then you got the, the Crandon collaboration of exactly. everybody going and stuff so, like that. Hopes are maybe somebody could get something started up out here. I've heard small rumors. There's definitely great tracks that exist out here on the West still. Well, like you said, too. So uh, I was thinking about this after you told me because you said, well, George, there's uh, there's other places for people to go. Like there's other series for people to go. Like you just said, AZOP and Desert Racing Series or Texplex or all these different places, right? But back if we backtrack a little bit, um, the Mickey Thompson Series in the stadiums, wasn't anything like what the Lucas Shore nope. course was right now. All of it grew and pivoted during those times, right? Yep. So this is just another one of those situations where the the racing, you know, uh, I don't know, family needs to be able to to move and to yep. adapt to the new new things that are happening. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, it, it really this whole COVID thing's got everybody kind of in a. I don't know, holding pattern almost, like not knowing what to do. But I wish that wasn't around because I think something would come up quickly. But, um, you know, I definitely think there's a void to fill, and hopefully there's someone out there that will do it. Um, you know, there's been little talk here and there, nothing that's that, that I've heard that's that's uh, for sure happening. But, um, you know, so I, I hope something happens. And don't give yeah. up and keep uh, – Let's let's keep all you know hoping that things work out and um, you know I wouldn't hesitate to go back to the Midwest to race some of those just to keep stuff going you know ultimately to take these trucks that we just put yeah, on the screen right exactly. now exactly <laughs> yeah I, I might be taking them back there and running a little bit because um, if if you never raced in the Midwest um, that dirt looks it, it, it's it's really good you know all those tracks that are back there um, they're they're even they're opener openers at a, a town back there in Wisconsin called Anago and uh, we used to race back there and it's in a uh, it's in a big dirt track mm -hmm. like it, it has grandstands covered grandstands the the parking will be on asphalt and grass um, that's a great really? venue they haven't raced there in a lot of years but they're going back they put that on their schedule so it's, dude that sounds awesome it, it is absolutely and, and that's what the old soda and the old core had they had a lot of you know dirt ovals where they build jumps down the front straight the back straight and ago when I last time I raced there was in the 90s that we went or 2001 probably went outside jumped out of the oval and then back into the oval and it was nice. really neat and um you know uh that don't, reminds don't, me of the la coliseum motocross back yeah. in the day like in the stands and that yeah. stuff i would say don't hesitate if you can go back there and, and do some racing and then um let's support them and let's uh, help them grow and uh see where, you know, it goes. see where it goes you know we have tracks out here and you know i know there's been talk about it. i don't think you know it's pretty pretty big step there but there had always been talk and I'm always saying hey you know you guys need to come out here and race and now with Lucas not racing any of these tracks it opens it up for um and I'm being a little bit hopeful here a little bit wishful it opens it up for the Midwest series to come here and go yeah. to Reno or go yep. to Glen Helen or go to Chandler tracks still yep. exist. and then go to Wheatland and I yeah. think you know if I had my two cents in there I think the Midwest series should be going to Wheatland yeah Next year, 100%, 2021, yeah. because Wheatland is a badass track. That facility is phenomenal. So, and the yeah. fans are crazy. That's the other thing about the Midwest, whether it's Missouri, whether it's Crandon, Michigan, you know, Bark River, any, any place back there, the fans are we were just a little UTV team, and I almost missed my uh, qualifying or practice because so many people were talking to us out yep. there in Missouri. Man, it was awesome. Yep. It was cool to see. Um, so bucket list for me would have been – I really want to go to Crandon, obviously, because it's such a phenomenal event. But ERX looks sweet. Yep. I definitely wanted to go there. Wheatland was an awesome track. And now it sounds like the track that you're talking about, that you jump in and out of the, the, the circle track or whatever yep. it is, would be a super cool place to go, too. Yep. And Bark River is one we haven't talked about. That's an awesome track, too. Where's it, that at? It's in the up UP, uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Oh, really? Yep. 
That's a pretty cool track too. It's absolutely a great track. Is is that the, the one with the split lanes? Was it still on the the Midwest sort course? Yeah. So ERX, I believe, has split lane. Um, Bark River has uh, the mound. There's basically a mount mound mound that separates yeah. the two halves of the tracks, and uh, the grandstands are on the mound. But the trucks, um, when they're close to the grandstand, they turn over the mound and they jump kind of sideways. Oh yeah. And the yeah, other yeah. way, when they come yep. back over, they got a jump. You pretty much jump anywhere from 150 to 200 feet. Yep, I remember so that. That that is uh Bark River. That thing that track looks cool. Um All right, so uh, Kevin McCullough uh chimed in again and said uh what was your favorite or most favorite or most challenging as a driver short course class you ever raced? So I'm thinking he's talking about uh maybe Pro 4, Pro 2, buggies. Yeah. Yeah, so um you know uh Pro 4 is pretty challenging. Um, especially in the current state that it is with um, all the different front differentials, the transmissions, um, and just, you know, the open rules and trying to figure out, you know, what type of rear suspension should you have on yeah. it and what type of front differential should you, you, should you have or, and transmission and stuff like that. So um, I think uh, Pro 4 was very challenging here uh, in, he in the last year. He probably wants you to say yeah. buggies because Kevin's a yeah. buggy driver. So. Yeah, bu buggies were uh, – Buggies were good. Hey, you told me a story earlier about the buggy stuff, like yep. uh, how it started and they didn't want you to race the, the pro buggy class? Yeah, so I, you know, a lot of people don't know. I never raced hey, a Tyrone. buggy in short course um, until uh, 2007. Um, I raced trucks in Mickey Thompson and then Soda Core. Right. And, uh, and then uh, in 2001, they made that the old Pro 4 that we talked about earlier. They made that truck illegal. So I got out of short course racing in 2001. Um, about, hiatus, we'll call yeah, it. Yeah, right? hiatus. And, uh, you know, I missed it. I paid attention. I watched. Um, but I was just dabbling, doing desert racing with different people and stuff like that. But uh, about in 2006, I started working with John Cooley on uh, building an, a, a Lumacraft pre-runner for me and um as i was visiting him talking on the phone i'm like john you should build one of those super buggies you know you, sh you should do that he goes oh i don't have time for that i got too much stuff going and, and he in talking he kept saying well why do you think i should i go because all the cars that are racing super buggy right now they're older mickey thompson cars and i don't think that's the right car they need to update they need to update yeah. them they need uh more wheelbase you know they need some different stuff so as time went on he's Every once in a while, he'd say, so should it be A-arm or a beam? And should it be this or should it be that? And one day, he called me and he said, hey, next time you're in the neighborhood, come by and check it out. I'm building the super buggy. And I'm like, really? So I went and checked it out. And I'm like, I talked to my buddy in Vegas, Larry Job, And I'm like, hey. And I took pictures. And I said, Larry, check it out. He's building these cars. And I, th I go, I think I'm going to get one. And uh, he, Larry ordered one too. And I ordered one. And nice. for the 2007 season, um, I'm going to get back involved in short course and, yep. uh, and, and drive super buggy. And at that time, um, early 2007, I got a phone call from Steve Barlow, who campaigned uh, Pro 2, sponsored by Red Bull in the, in the core series. And he said, hey, um, you interested in driving my Pro 2 next year in 2007? I'm like, heck yeah. I've been, you know, it's funny you ask and funny you call because I really want to get back in short course race. Yep. And I ordered a Pro buggy. Well, at that time, they were called Super Buggy. I ordered a buggy. And uh, I want to do it. I go, is it a problem if I race both? You know, will you let me race your Pro 2? And uh, I race the buggy too. He goes, yeah, as long as you can do it. And it doesn't interrupt with anything. So I was right, right on. I'm back in racing short course. Nice. And I happened to be down in Baja. And I found out that my, I had sent in my Super Buggy entry before I went to Baja. And when I was down there, I got a phone call and said, hey, um, Core, Jim Baldwin, denied your entry into Super Buggy. Oh, shit. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I've got money invested in this car. It's almost done. I'm going right. You got to be kidding me. Like, so and I, he's telling me I can't race? And they're telling me I can't race. And I'm like, why can't I race? They said, well, you're, you're a pro driver. You can't race Super Buggy. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm thinking of this investment that I've already been spending. And like, how am I going to get my money back? So I ended up. Well, no, hey, you want to race it. And I wanted to race. So I ended up calling, uh, trying to get a hold of Jim Baldwin, called his office, said, I need to talk to him. He said, he, he's busy right now. And I said, no, I'm in Mexico. <laughs> I want to talk to him right now. So they ended up getting him on the phone. And uh, he told me, he goes like, look, I don't want you racing the buggy class. I want you racing in the Pro 2. And he kept telling me and said, he laughed about the buggy. And you don't want to race a buggy, Rob. And I'm like, no, I do. And he goes, you, you just park the buggy, sell the buggy, and race Pro 2. And I go, how about this? I go, I, take me off the Pro 2 list. I'm racing my super buggy. He goes, you don't want to do that. I go, I, I go, take me off Pro 2. Yeah. Take me off Pro 2. I go, I'm not. He goes, we need you. I go, I'm not doing it. Hung up the phone. A day later, he called back and he goes, I got it figured out. 
I'm going to change the name to Pro Buggy. <laughs> so Perfect. That's, that's how Super Buggy became Pro Buggy. And um, from that time on, Lumacraft started building cars. And, that's awesome. And uh, started selling How many selling of these conversations more. come up and you're like, shit, man, we've paved a little bit of a way for some of these classes. That's yeah, cool. there's a few of them. The, the Pro 4, the Track Width Rule, the Super Buggy, Pro Buggy thing. There's a couple others. So I feel like those are so co- such cool stories, though. I mean, it gives so much validity to the uh, the classes nowadays that race. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, Kevin races in that yep. class now, so it's pretty cool for him to see. Um, hey, guys, we're going to answer a couple more of your comments, and then we're going to take a quick commercial break. So um, let's see here. So, well, wh- how about this? So this isn't actually a, a question, but Brian Hawkins said, I bet uh, chasing is much easier in non-COVID times. I don't know. I mean – Chasing, chasing, or? Well, yeah. Um, you know, I guess the biggest problem we had is, is people. You know, I was probably only had uh, maybe two-thirds of the people that we normally have in Baja. We had a lot of them that couldn't get off work or, or um, you know, Whatever couldn't take was, the chance. Yeah, yeah they, they had the stipulations from their, their employer that wouldn't allow them. If they went to Baja, they'd come home, have to quarantine, yeah. no pay. There was all kinds of things like that, which is all understandable. So for us, you know, it was definitely um, – you know, for me, a lot of stress going on before figuring out if I had Planning. enough people. Yeah. And then also I didn't feel right, um, you know, begging people to go, yeah. you know, at this time. It's like, you know, you, you either want to go or not. And I put it out there and I respect your opinion if you don't want to go to Baja. So, um, you know, chasing ultimately, you know, I think we, we had a good plan, good time, good people and a su- successful race. Everybody came home safe. Nobody was uh, – you know, there's no no problems. Nobody that I know of got sick from Baja or yeah. anything so yet. So maybe chasing isn't more difficult. It's just different. Yeah. Yeah. More yeah. different, a little different. Uh, Tyrone Robinson said, uh, well, I, your body recovers pretty quick, but how long is your uh, body reco- recovery after a Baja 1000? Well, what I can tell you, so after the Baja 1000, I felt great. Then I went to help my son for one day when he raced three times on Sunday. And on Monday, I was worn out, beat. So um, he raced three times. It's pretty much weak. Does means- that mean if you had gotten in the seat and raced on that uh, at the works races, you would have been better off than walking Probably. around? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I, I find I do a lot of timing. I'm his, I'm his spotter. I'm his, uh, I'm his pit crew guy. Yeah. Um, and I, so I end up walking from basically – Here's an example. I walked to the spotter stand. Yep. Then I walked to the other side so I could time him. And then I walked to the hot pit so if he has a problem, I can be there. And then I walk. So I do that. He basically does five laps, and I make that big circle. So <laughs> I, I need to get a – Hey, so what, <laughs> what we need to figure out is some of these guys that said they want to help you in Baja, let's go take yeah. them to the works race yeah, and get well, a little bit more support. I, I need help in Baja, but my son needs help yeah. at works. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get some of you guys uh, to help Rob down in Baja. And then uh, when the kids come, the kids can come help with Caden as well uh, okay so a couple more questions then we're gonna take a commercial break uh, jim's in said mcdonald's was the answer yeah so uh, i've never ate there three meals in a row <laughs> never ever <laughs> well in wisconsin i did <laughs> yeah i feel like you have to sometimes right traveling yeah. is just makes you eat so much different stuff yeah um yeah and don don haugen chimed in again said what george you've never been to fall crandon yeah unfortunately i haven't man and that is definitely a bucket list uh he said it's hands down the best short course race or event in the world uh to attend uh they're going to be running the the midwest uh, so they're a utv team and it sounds like they're yep. going to be running the midwest series works and Texplex. so might be sprinkling it around a little bit i don't know if any of those races are going to overlap but Man, that sounds like they got a good plan. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good plan. That's a lot of races too. Textbooks, I think there's there's ten in their series, one a month, and then they have that uh, twelve hour race in December. Yeah, that twelve hour race seems like it'd be a kind of a cool race, yep. right? That's a kick. Is uh, does Caden ever want to do any of those? He wants to do everything. Yeah, so he's <laughs> he's uh, he's he was yeah. I haven't heard anything just lately, but and I didn't realize. I think they're are they doing a twelve hour race this year too? In two weeks. In two weeks, yeah. So I thought it was only next year, but I realized they're no, doing no. it again. They're yeah. doing it this year as well. Yeah, in two weeks. Start, yeah, so, so I think that's the first annual maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. But the cool part about the Texplex is you and I talked about it earlier, and I know a lot of these guys know about it. And, uh, Don, you might want to change all your plans knowing that they're going to have, uh, I think it's almost a seventy or $80,000 payout for the normally aspirated class and the uh, Pro Turbo class. So, man, that's phenomenal that they're doing that. Can my pro four race? <laughs> yeah. I'm just joking. We gotta get, dude. You can bring the family wagon. We <laughs> yeah. just talked about this. Yep. Go give those Miller boys a run for their money. Um, Rob, can you explain what a G out is? And that's from or, or uh, Ortega Alberto. Yeah. So, um, 
So the, the road that we were on was a gas line road, and imagine it's like a roller coaster. So right. it had basically, I, I think I was, uh, I was planning that they were just down, up, down, up, and they were nice separated. Yeah, they were smooth. There was kind of a rhythm going, and for some reason, um, I don't know how I missed it, but it, was a, it went down, a little bit up, down, and then big up. And we basically flew, as we went down and went up the little up, I was ready to go up, up, Except it went down, so we took off and landed in the face of the last yeah, so one. Like and, a yeah, and, and the the trophy truck, um, it basically it landed on it hit so hard it landed on the front skid plate and it bent the two tubes. Holy in, shit! Really? And uh, it bent those two tubes in, and they had to get cut out and replaced before um before the five hundred. It was that gnarly. Yeah, it and then the the fuel cell. There's a skid pan under the fuel cell in the back, and it it compressed so hard in the front, then it slapped the back down, and it bent tubes in the back of the truck underneath the fuel cell. Holy too, so. smokes. So, but the, well, your back didn't fare so well, no. but the, the truck was able to complete the Yeah, race, yeah, it just bent some tubes. And the steering, I forgot about that. The steering was kicked sideways too. Holy and I don't smokes. remember exactly why that happened. I think it, I don't remember why that was, what was bent there. That's But it that's knocked crazy. the steering out too. So it just compressed my back, knocked the wind out of me. And, um, you know, ultimately the jarring, you could imagine once your back yeah. was, was damaged, the jarring was... Um, basically shooting pins and needles. So. so to even go a little bit further with this answer, have you ever fell down backwards, like uh, if you're roller skating and you fall on your tailbone and you get that compression, like that yeah. real sharp pain? That was probably similar to what Rob was feeling in his back afterwards. Um, haha, Rob always assigns my chase pits near the best taco stands, and that was Tony. <laughs> well, yeah, Tony's Tony Braza um, – Pretty soon he'll be coming out with his own book of all the restaurants in Baja to go check Dude, out because send me one. <laughs> Tony's gonna do that. Like I keep, the, I brainstorm with ideas and somebody. That's one of the things somebody needs to come up with the the Baja um, Bible, foodie book, the Baja, the Baja Bible, Bible of food. Yeah. And, and Tony, <laughs> uh, we always laugh because um, you know his his reason for going to Baja isn't to chase; it's to go eat. Man, dude, <laughs> but Tony, I, I kind of feel like I could get along with this guy. Yeah, no, he's awesome. He knows where all the, the good taco stands are, and and uh, he's always doing that. So uh, we have a lot of good fun. I've known him for a long time, and, um, you know, always always razz him and give him the most difficult places I to go. I think I just became best friends with Tony. Yeah. Uh, he's up for the task. <laughs> so uh, Special Ed says, uh, Lake Havasu always welcomes off-road ra- Always welcomes off-road racers, and we know that by the UTV World Championship. Did Caden get to do the UTV World? No, he didn't, and that's the thing. Um, you know, right now he only has the one RS1, and he was one week after the UTV World Championships was Works Blythe, uh, and um, you know we just car. weren't prepared. So we we need to, you know, Caden's got uh, a little bit of support from Polaris, and we need to get him some more cars and and get him doing more stuff. So we're gonna have to give um, our buddy Craig Scanlon a call over here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, um, Jamie Campbell. Uh, also, one of the guys that did very well in Baja, he uh, chimed in and said, Rob, what's your favorite soft drink, LOL? Could it be Mountain Dew? <laughs> <laughs> yep. We got some Mountain Dew. <laughs> oh, I got one for you. Have you ever had a white man's margarita? Mm, I don't think so. Tequila and Mountain Dew. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we usually mix it with Patron and yeah. Diet Mountain Dew, but, dude, they're phenomenal. They'll blow your mind. Congratulations to Jamie on a pretty awesome deal. If you guys don't know, Jamie owns Race Co., and yep. they built a Honda – and uh, ended up winning their class and almost winning overall. That's phenomenal. Well, they like won like, overall, but they got a little penalty. I yeah. know how that goes. Yeah. Man, I I still could – when I was, like, thinking about it, like, a couple days later after I saw the news, first of all, I think that uh, it's awesome to have the uh, – well, we talk manufacturer competition yep. now in the uh, UTV class. So you have all the different manufacturers, Honda, Yamaha, uh, Kawasaki, Polaris, and Can-Am. It, that's five different manufacturers. Yep. You know, like, even in NASCAR, they don't have five. Yeah. And that's, you know, to me, off-road racing, whether it's UTVs or, or trucks, whatever it is, it needs manufacturer involvement. Dude, 100%. And when off-road racing was the best it ever was, it's when it had uh, manufacturer involvement. Back yeah. in the late 80s, early 90s. Like Roger Mears. Exactly. Days. You had yeah. Nissan. You had, uh, yep. you know, you had Ford, Dodge, Toyota. You had all those guys involved. And, um, you know, that's. Jeep, like the. Exactly. Jeff, yeah. Jeff Furrier just got done redoing yep. the Dos yep. I, I raced factory Jeep in, for Walker Evans in, in 88, 89, and 90. Yep. And uh, those were the best times. And ultimately, that's that's what UTV has going for it right now is they have manufacturers that are involved in, in every series. We need to get them 
keep getting them involved, whether it's works or whatever it can be. Keep getting them involved, and it'll make make the world go around, racing world go around even better. So I couldn't agree more. Uh, Tyrone Robinson said uh, Mickey Thompson at the L.A. Coliseum was epic. <laughs> Absolutely, I miss those days. And uh, you know, I was. Uh, if any of you guys don't don't remember. Um, LA Coliseum was pretty badass because we raced on the floor where the football field was, but then also the out. arches, they, they would take the grandstands out. They'd put dirt over the, the yep. steps and then we would run up the, up the steps where the stands would normally be and jump up through the arches, go out, do a U-turn and then come back in. And yeah. to give you guys a visual of what that looks like when you're going up the, up the, the steps, and you look up, all you're seeing is the top of the arch. Yeah. So you're basically aiming to stay in between the two walls, which were really only about, they might have been 15 feet wide yep. total. It didn't look like that wide, but that's about how wide they were. So you had to aim for that and jump through Was them. there any time that you had to, like, be uh, with another guy? No. I mean, if you speed? tried to go through side by side, you somebody was going to hit the wall. Yeah. So those were incredible <laughs> times, Mickey Thompson, uh, entertainment group uh, running – Incredible. I remember when I was a little kid and I first saw those races, even the dirt bike guys when they yep. would do it too, I was like, oh my God, like how are these guys, even, like what can they see when they do it? And then coming back down into the stadium must have been super cool because you got to come back down and maybe there's stands or fans on the side and like yeah. come back into the lights. That yeah. must have been like... Yo, you, when you came back in, you could see the grandstands on the other side of the football field, but you couldn't see the football field. So you're like, you oh, oh I better not oversend it. Yeah, because <laughs> you could flatland it too. You needed to check up. Um, ever run Elk? You, you have run Elk River. Have you ever run Elk River Motorsports Park? No, I've never been there, actually. Oh, I thought you did. No, I've never. I've seen it on TV. So I, I, I everything I know about ERX is from uh, TV. Looks yeah. like a great place. It really does. Yeah. And I think that's the one I was talking about with the split lanes. Yeah, they have split lane there. Yeah. So um, Tyrone Robinson. Yep, the jumps uh between the torch was bad at the la coliseum that was man uh best demolition derby i ever saw was antigo fairgrounds yeah anago know. yep that's where they're going back so anago anago yep anago um as you know a lot of times in the midwest maybe you get some rain so i think maybe what he's talking about could be uh either they did have uh uh crash and burn stuff there or it's really? the mud races where you're sliding slipping and sliding crashing into each other so we were talking about this <laughs> earlier too like you always want to see the guy win but a lot of people go out there to see the guys crash yeah absolutely so, and that's why i think short course is well i won't say was is always so good is because it's basically mma with a yep. car a truck right because you're sliding you're yep. bashing into each other i mean even the utv guys do it too it's yep. it's gnarly man i love seeing that stuff uh, Brian Forrester commented in saying, uh, Lucas should do a one race uh, season, one race a season at w the Wheatland race, just like uh, UTV World's Fun. That would actually be kind of cool, but you, you already get so many people saying this is the UTV championship. Like, it would just be yeah. another UTV championship. Yeah, Wheatland's an incredible facility. Um, great track there. And, you know, I, I thought, you know, it's possible. And I thought they were actually going to try to do that run. Like out here on the West, we had regionals. I right. you know at Wheatland, they could run regionals, you know, how oh, easy yeah. races there. And it's a big enough property, big enough track. They could even change up the track and but do I different like your things. I idea to have the Midwest guys go there. Yeah, I think they should. I mean, soon as I heard, you know, as soon as Lucas shut the doors, I, I was ready to get on the phone. I, I know they already, I know that some of the players back there and I know it's, you know, they thought of it too. I wasn't the only one that thought well, about that. But you, you bring up a good point, though, because like people are like, "Oh, the series is done," but the tracks aren't done. No. The tracks are still open. Nope. In fact, I heard the other day, and, and Brian Forrester was the one that told me this. He said that uh, Jarrett Brooks is going to have a uh, just little kids yep. come out, and he's going to teach the little kids how to drive at Glen Helen. So he's going to start doing little classes and stuff because yep. he knows that the tracks are still open. And he wants to get his time Absolutely. in and help others. Absolutely, and those things, they need to keep happening. You know, maybe, uh, you know, you brought Glen Helen up, and uh, back in the day, and I don't even know how long ago, 15, 20 years ago, Glen Helen used to have short course-style races there. Yeah. Um, they ran, you know, I don't know if they ran once a not month. Not on that or same track? Yeah, well, uh, no, not the same track. They had It was more over where the motocross guys run, Okay. and um, they kind of had an off little bit of an off-road track. They're kind of like the works track, but not that tight. And uh, they they ran over there. They had a series. I don't know how many races it was. I never raced in any, but you know, they, I I would assume they had a four, four, five, six, seven race series, and they had different classes: five, sixteen hundred, sixteen hundred buggies, probably class tens. They had stuff going there, and that's what we that's need. Cool. Maybe Glenn Helen could start yeah. doing that again. Dude, that you know? would be super cool. And there's so many opportunities. Like when we talk about all this stuff, and everybody's like, "Oh, what should we do?" Well. Everybody should get out there and start doing stuff so that it can all fall into place. Because one of these things, when you throw a bunch of uh, 
what do they say? Throw a, a bunch of stuff at the wall, something's going to stick. Yeah. You know, I'll remind you when core in two, when the economy went away in 08, core went away. Yeah. What happened in 09? We yeah. had Tony Vanilla and Lucas Oil, and we had Ricky Johnson and Torque. Popped up. Yeah. The very next year. And maybe that's what can happen. Ooh, so. I, yeah, I have high hopes for this. Uh, yeah, Jim, Jim Zinn said, short course buggy dork, good times. Yeah, Jimbo. Jimbo was my crew chief. Yeah? So, yeah. So when you were doing the buggy stuff? Yep. The very, my second year, I ended up in uh, 2007. I raced for uh, Steve Barlow and my own uh, right. super buggy turned pro buggy. And then in 08, <laughs> I went to drive. Super with, pro buggy? With, yeah, super pro buggy. <laughs> I went to drive for Menzies, and Jimbo was, uh, he was the crew chief on the, the pro buggies for myself and Larry Job at Menzies. Oh, man, Don Haugen's chiming in again. He says, uh, I have been on the fence to get uh, his son Chance a Pro 2 or a Pro 4. Uh, would this be a good time to pick one? I think you'd probably get a good deal on one of them because some of the teams would be wanting to get out of them. Um, but it depends on the level of effort that you want to put in because I think the Midwest is about the only place you can go. Yeah, call me. Yeah. I got plenty. <laughs> I got two Pro 2s and one, one current Pro 4. And uh, we definitely know that those trucks are good. So uh, here, why don't we do this? We'll show them. Uh, we'll do a little sales pitch. So 30-second sales pitch. You see these trucks right here. Yep. All you got to do is shine them up a little bit, and they're ready to go, Don. <laughs> Clean one owners. Lots of spare parts. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of spare parts. Wife's, wife's bike never raced? Yeah. <laughs> no, they're good. The Pro 4 is actually fully prepped. It's fresh, prepped, ready to race. The Pro 2 was fresh, prepped, and raced Crandon. Yeah. Um. Those things are really cool, Don, too. Like, we got to check them out a little bit today, so uh, Chance would get a good uh, a good truck if he wanted one of those bad boys. Uh, all right, so um, let's see here. We got to go through these comments real quick because I got to take a whiz. So, actually, you know what? Let's just go to a commercial break, and we'll be right back. There's too many of them. So, we'll see you guys in just a sec. Hello, I'm Justin, the founder of Shock Therapy. Shock Therapy has been around for five years, but we have personally been tuning suspension on off-road cars and race vehicles for over 25 years. We tune between 10 and 15 cars per day, every single day of the week. Our concentration is tuning shock systems and supplying components that improve the ride quality of your car in many ways. Not only do we work on the average UTV, but we also tune suspension for race teams and professional drivers. We currently tune for over 87 race teams in Best in Desert and SCORE. Our clients and race teams rely on our suspension components to allow them to win races and keep them safe. Suspension is a moving target. We are always trying to hit that target with every customer that we work with. Each customer's needs can be different and we tune our kits accordingly. Our research and development never stops. We improve our components every single day. As the industry evolves and improves, so do our parts and kits. As of right now, we have over 100 products for UTVs. So when you bring your car to us, you have the satisfaction of knowing that you have the most experience, the highest quality products, and the fact that your car is being tuned specifically to you. Zollinger Racing builds the best aftermarket products available, products for your UTV or snowmobile, including billet radius rods, billet tie rods, billet steering knuckles, billet steering racks, alternator kits, and much more. All manufactured in the United States in-house at their headquarters in Nibley, Utah. Travis Zollinger and his team test in some of the most brutal conditions, racing in places like the Best in the Desert Mint 400, Ultra 4 King of the Hammers, 
UTV World Championships, and many more. Visit ZollingerRacingProducts.com and use the code DIRTLIFE to get 10% off your next purchase and join us on social media at Zollinger Racing Products to see our products in action. Zollinger Racing, the best products, period. Yeah, finally, we got Lance from Solderweld in the studio. Oh, Thanks for coming down, bud. Hey, why don't we just record a commercial now? Yeah, why not? So good to be here, man. It's been a lot. I've been trying to get down here forever, uh, and I uh, wanted to talk about the off-road kit. Dude, I love those things. I got it in uh, my pack. Yeah, we're running uh, hundreds of uh, vehicles now running them, whether it's a UTV or some guy's got it in a backpack and it was motocross. He's got uh, everything he needs to make a fix right there on the fly, out on the trail, uh, or in the desert, whatever it is. Well, since I've already used one, I kind of know what to use it for, but uh, explain what it does. All right, so let's pull one out real quick. You've got your aluminum rods. Remember, they're rods, right? So, uh, you know, light torch, small torch. You can uh, throw it in there or throw it on the rig with your flux. It decontaminates and cleans like, a, let's say, a radiator. You get a random rock chip runs through uh, as you're racing. You get a rock chip and a radiator. you got to fix it right there or you're yep. out of the race. You can patch it up. You can of patch it up. It's all good to go. Yep, just like welding. Yeah, also as well with that, you've got a brake line fix. So uh, with your flux, you can fix a uh, brake line, stainless steel, steel, and then uh, your hop lock, heat absorption putty. So it yep. keeps you from getting burned, number one, as well as keeps the heat from traveling. So uh, it's really, uh, really nice. I've used this not even to fix anything. So it's, that stuff works <laughs> it's, so good, man. Listen, it's easy. It's uh, It straps in nicely so that you uh, have everything you need in one little place. And you don't have to carry a big bag in it's the It's like a uh, first truck. aid uh, kit for your vehicle. Yeah, chase trucks have it as well so that, uh, you know, if they need to make a fix on the fly, they can get it done and get it done quick and get you back in the race. Dude, those things are so cool. All right, so it's at SolderWeld on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, SolderWeld.com. Awesome. All right, thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Yeah, guys, thanks for joining us. Episode 66 of the Dirt Life Show. We really appreciate you guys hanging out with us tonight. Uh, that's a little late in Arizona. I know it's 7.30 here in California, but uh, we still have Rob Mack with us. Uh, so thank you very much, Rob, for letting us come to the uh, the shop and hang out. So uh, like I said, episode 66, I'm Georgie Hamill. So we'll get right back into it, man. We had some uh, some comments come in that we just we couldn't get to them because there's too many of them. But uh, need uh, an off-road segue. Um, well, actually, Tyrone, they do have an off-road Segway now. They have a, a Segway came out with a UTV. Did you see that, Rob? No, I didn't. Yeah, so Segway has a UTV out now. Oh, nice. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things that I was thinking is that Nicola also has a Segway, yeah. or excuse me, a, a side-by-side. One of the things that I was thinking is those things are phenomenal horsepower because they have the electric engines and stuff. It'd be pretty cool to see those things get to the ability where uh, they have some sort of quick removable battery. And even if they had to, in a 500-mile race, stop every 100 miles or so, if they could actually do that, I think yeah. it'd be pretty cool to see something like that. Yeah, you figure it's only a matter of time. Yeah. <laughs> And the amount of power and torque and things that those guys have is crazy. Um, yeah, Don Haugen chimed in again. Don, I'm going to skip this one for a, a little bit because that's uh, um, about chance. Valley Tea Taco Stand is what Mike Montes said. Is that Valley <laughs> Tea have a good taco stand? No, absolutely. That's, lately, that's been the best tacos in all of Baja, I think. So I just need to go down there and hang out with, uh, yeah. with, with your guys' crew and go chill with those guys. Uh, what about the Imperial Valley 250 pole story? Yeah, Whoops. that that didn't work out so well. What is that? Ah, uh, so um, you got Imperial the Valley. Yeah, no, I hit the I hit the pole. I didn't get the pole. Oh, <laughs> I hit the I pole. I think I saw that. Yeah. What yes. was that sticking out of the dust? Or yeah, something? so I guess it's an old uh, bombing range, that area, and it's a pole. That what I was told was that's a pole that used to have something that they used to try to hit, and um, it was right at the beginning of the race, and I. I think that was the second or third year that they ran a, a, a score, ran a race there. The first year or two, I didn't race my truck. I had Andy McMillan drive it because I had short course. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, raced the short course race, and then Andy did the, the trophy truck there. So the third time oh, I was able to go there, yeah. yeah. So the second or third time they had it, I was able to be there and um, ended up, uh, I think I – battled uh B it was bj baldwin i went off the line with him i got him out of the infield he i think he passed me in the infield right off the start and then i was right on him and i was in the dust 
and the course had a little kink in it, but that pole was to the left, and I ended up just hitting it dead on straight and uh, took out the left upper A arm and you sway bar link. And it, we were d- no, no, didn't get hurt, but basically took the the truck out of the race. That, that was a that seems like somebody a bad deal. Took that pole out of the ground, right? Well. I guess hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah, I took it out. <laughs> <laughs> you should have charged more for that. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Angel said, evening, boys, tacos. Mm, yep. We always talk about tacos on this show, right? Uh, maybe we should be called Taco Life instead of the Dirt Life. Uh, Wisconsin still has the best fresh cheese curds. Dave Clark will agree. I True. don't know. Is Dave Clark one of your crew, too? Yeah, Dave Dave Clark uh, was one that helped build that the knife rank truck, the air oh, shock yeah, truck. Oh, yeah, that, you said yep. that before. So Dave, Dave and I... We met, he worked at Venable Racing, he built trucks for Venable, he built, uh, uh, he and I built one of the Mickey Thompson Stadium trucks that I raced, then they built this uh, truck, they also built, if you guys remember the single seat trophy truck that I drove, yeah. um, and I believe that was 1996, they built that, Dave Man, and, and I. He's got some hands on some pretty good trucks. Yeah, not, and Dave also built uh, the first pro two, first two Pro 2s that Menzi had, one oh, for really? me and one for Bryce, um, and I still own, own that truck as well. Man, that's um, cool. Dave built Vildosola's trophy truck. And he likes cheese curds. And he likes cheese curds. Cheese curds are delicious, man. Uh, is Baja Fool's uh, tri-top uh, going to be on there? I don't know what that means. So I'm, I'm suspecting that means tri-tip. Is it? And, uh, yeah, the joke is um, uh, last year's Baja 400, I had a little bit of a break issue and spent a little bit uh, of extra time in the pit. And I asked them if they had anything to eat, and they had tri-tip. So they fed me tri-tip in really? the pit. Yes. And then this Baja, <laughs> Baja 1000, uh, same thing happened. Um, those guys that that are for, b- the Baja Fools guys that are from Northern California bring tri-tip down. And uh, they had tri-tip for me this year when I got out of the truck at Mike's Road at mile 422. So I had tri-tip this year at Baja 1000 as Is well. Is that what, like, going to become a tradition or <laughs> no, what? No, absolutely. See, it's so good that I've created it a tradition. So that's now perfect. the Baja Fools, they have tri-tip in their pit. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome, dude. They tried feeding me ribs this year, too, at mile 740 right before I got back in the truck about 1 a.m. in the morning. And I'm like, <laughs> nah, I better wait. I already had tri-tip. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Uh, Jeff Wolf commented in saying, hey, Rob, do you remember my uncle? Terry Wolf, uh, who was the president of SO, yeah, Soda. Soda. Yep. Yeah. I grew up watching your ra- watching you race. Uh, now I race a light 1600 buggy uh, in the COR series. Uh, the Ford Rough Riders were awesome. Yep, I remember them. Good people. Yeah, that's actually pretty cool. It's neat to go down memory lane with some of these guys, yeah. right? Because um, on a daily basis, I'm sure, like, I don't think about a lot of stuff in my life. I'm sure that some of this stuff is thinking, like, oh, wow, triggering a, a couple of memories, right? Yeah. Um, NYE built the AWD class uh, class one buggy, and that was from Braden Lopez. I don't know what that is. Yeah. You know what that is? Oh, so that's Nye. Nye bu- yes, Nye built the all-wheel drive class one oh, Nye. buggy. Oh, okay. Yep. Nye, Nye Frank, uh, and Dave Clark built the all-wheel drive uh, class one buggy for Riviera Racing. It was a single-seater. I think, uh, I don't think that was the right car. I was thinking they nicknamed it the Hedgehog, but I think that was another one of uh, the Riviera buggies. But, yeah. Was so a pretty good car? Yeah, it was a, it was a great car. Didn't have a lot of success. Um, I think it won a, a race or two. I actually, I think Robbie Gordon actually won a best in desert race with it. And then uh, that car went away. And then uh, Nye Frank, they, the next all-wheel drive thing they built, that was, so that truck was, that buggy was probably built in the early 2000s. Wow, that was a and good then, amount of time ago. Yeah, and then uh, they also built an all-wheel drive trophy truck for Dale Dondell that he won um, at least one race with. I think he won at Laughlin with it. So Nye was someone who was, you know, you'd say he was ahead of his time. He built some stuff for Mickey Thompson, land speed record cars, um, he also built, uh, was part of the crew that built um, uh, s- some drag race cars um, as well. So, do a lot you have of history. A, talking about all these cars, do you have uh, one that stands out the most in your, in your uh, well, last, we'll call it 20 years or so? Yes. So, f- for me, the Pro 4 that I have here, that, that, that uh, the, older one. the old one that has it, Nye Frank, uh, that, that one stands out for me because it was, uh, pretty neat. The front steering geometry, the suspension geometry on that was uh, was pretty innovative at the time, and having air shocks on it, and the ride height that kind of set some standards and stuff that we we did, and had some unique stuff on it. So that truck for me is it's really um, the only old race vehicle that I have anymore. Everything else is something that's newer. 
But uh, that truck was pretty cool. We put a lot of you know heart and soul in that truck over the years back when we raced it, and it has it. Well, it still looks badass, but it had such a good lifespan too. Yeah. As, as a competitive winning truck. Yeah, it, it did really well. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's good. what about like uh one of the first cars? Like, let's just say it was your first ten years of uh, of racing. What was your first favorite? Yeah. So when I first started racing, um. Uh, we ended up, uh, my dad was in, a general contractor in Las Vegas, and he raced in the early 70s. In the early 80s, uh, he approached me and said, hey, you want to you wanna try racing off-road? And I said, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I was into sports, basketball, baseball, stuff like that. And so he, Who would have thought, though? Yeah, I, I had no idea. I mean, I, I raced motorcycles when I was little, and then, um, you know, and I had no aspiration. I wasn't reaching out to do off-road and, at the time, and he ended up... Uh, building a commercial building for himself and rented out some spaces uh, within that building and, and a company from Tucson, Arizona called Off-Road Buggy Supply came and rented from him. I like and that they, term, by the way. Yeah, so they sold off-road parts and uh, my dad ended up, um, you know, coming from coming into his office one day and the guy that owned the business said, hey, Bob, I'm, I'm moving, I'm out of here, I'm closing down the shop and uh, I'm going to be out by the end of the month. My dad said, hey, I'm sorry to hear that and... Um, about 10 minutes later, the guy came up to him and said, uh, came up to his office and said, uh, why don't you just buy all this, buy the store from me so I don't have to pack it up and leave it. So they made a deal. Nice. I had a job. I was probably 14 years old. Now after school, I went in, had a job selling VW parts. And uh, that uh, turned into my dad going over to Butch Dean, Pat Dean's dad, who was right around the corner, owned Valley Performance and ran cars for Collins and Herps and some other people like that. And my dad introduced himself to Butch and said, hey, i bought the store over here so they became partners that's so in, cool. in the buggy shop and uh from there that's when my dad said at 16 you want to try off-road racing we ended up buying an old high jumper single se seater that was owned by a guy by the name of bob gurkey who his, his sons billy and robbie gurkey they ran collins motorsports and now they run uh class one buggy for brendan gone and, oh, and nice. uh and uh jake gone so um you know, we ended up buying that car, and I started in a high jumper. Uh, Kevin Bunderson is somebody that some people know, old school guys know. He ended up renting a – he was renting a, a, a place. Yeah. So Kevin Bunderson was renting one of the places in my dad's building, and he was building Baja Bugs and ended up building a tandem Class 1 buggy and stuff like that. And Kevin ended up building us a Class 10 car uh, for 1984. I raced that and then did, did okay, uh, won some races and stuff like that. And then um, Jack Johnson, we talked about him earlier – he raced, I call it the house car for mm -hmm. Butch Dean, and he wanted to move on. He wanted to get up in a truck ride, so he stopped racing the Class 1 buggy and, and got a ride with Nissan, and uh, that gave an open seat to that Class 1 buggy, and I ended up driving that in 86, 87. Um, and then that got me more uh, knowing Michael Gaughan. Um, During the owner. those times, you must have been so well, I don't want to say satisfied because you're always wanting to do more, but it must have been so cool to get the opportunity to drive these vehicles. Like hindsight, obviously, like we would all love to drive those yeah. in, in this day and age vintage vehicles, but those were like ahead of their time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Kevin, Kevin Bunderson, you know, not only Kevin, Butch Dean, he was an innovator. Kevin Bunderson was an innovator. Um, you know, getting to drive Butch Dean's car that was sponsored by uh, Barbary Coast, Michael Gaughan, led me to knowing and meeting Walker Evans, who then in 1988 gave me, uh, you know, uh, uh, I got a factory ride with Jeep and, yep. and Goodyear, 88, 89, and 90. I drove for him. And uh, kind of a funny little story. Walker Evans was supposed to retire when he turned 50. Supposed to retire. He was supposed to <laughs> retire when he turned 50. And then I was going to step into his ride and drive his Class 8 truck. Well, he didn't retire. Yep. He kept going. So I ended up uh, moving over to the Ford Rough Riders, which Robbie Gordon <laughs> – was driving for Jim Venable in Class 8, and Robbie's asphalt career started taking off with, um, I believe they called it IMSA, IMSA yep. at the time, and he raced a GTO car for Ford, and I believe that was um, Jack Roush. I remember that transition. Yeah, so Robbie left the off-road, and I ended up uh, being one of two guys that they were going to hire. It was between me and Rod Millen. Yep. When they called me and told me it's between you and Rod Millen, I'm like, well, I'm going to lose because <laughs> Rod Millen was who I looked up to, yeah. and I'm like, he's better than me, and – I, I want to be like him, so I'm never going to get this ride. I ended up go getting a test drive, and uh, about a few days later, they called me up and said, can you come down to the shop? In the, that's funny. The, the Venable Racing Shop is 
actually about 100 yards from where we are now. That's awesome. Uh, so in 1991, I drove for Venable Racing, and I got the ride over Rod, which blew my mind. He must have had something else to do, so that's why I got it, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, that gave me uh, the opportunity to race Class 8 and then Trophy Truck in 94, and, uh, you know, had a great run from 91 to 96. Did you ever get, like, uh, uh, I don't know, pre-race nerves are a different question, but did you ever get the the, the feeling like, wow, this is, like, really escalating quickly. Like, I mean, I guess it's not quick because you're putting in the work over the years, but, man, I'm already in a trophy truck, or, man, I'm already in this buggy, or, man, I'm already... Yeah. Well, it, it took time. You know, I thought, you know, one of the things I always remember, things that my mom and dad told me when I was little, and one of them was be patient, yeah. you know, and... Uh, work hard. Yeah, work hard, be patient, and, and, and uh, you know, I did a lot of that and ended up just the path ended up working out. You know, honestly, you look back and all the different direction that things could have went and, yep. and the direction that they did go, I'm very thankful for. Had a lot of good opportunities and uh, enabled me to, to race, you know, for 35 plus years, you know, now that I've, I've been racing. And I've actually, you know, somewhat, you know, I got paid to drive by Walker Evans. Right. And uh, I was blown away. I actually agreed to drive with him. And about a week later, they called me and said, hey, we forgot to tell you, we're going to pay you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, cool. That's awesome. So, yeah. um, but realized, the fact is that you were willing to put in the hard work before yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, I felt, you know, ultimately, like I, we talked about earlier, you know, find people that have as much passion as you do. Oh, but yeah. I had a ton of passion in it too. And I wanted to learn and, you know, sub some of the things back in the day in Baja, we didn't have GPSs. We didn't, the map was like a, you know, ink written, yep. penned out thing. And it's like, <laughs> I had to figure it out. And I went and bought a, how do I learn Baja? And I went and bought a AAA map and I read books and I looked <laughs> around. And as I was pre-running with Walker, you know, I was looking at the landscape and I was asking questions, where's that? What's this? Got you it. know, trying to read about it. And that's how I did it in the day. But I also realized I had the passion. Yep. I really wanted to do this. Yeah. And that's, you know, looking back, at, at success of anyone, you can pretty much figure out. It's the passion. It's yeah. the passion. Yeah. The passion is key. Yeah, and then obviously the work ethic after that yep. too. Um, man, we keep getting these comments coming in. Tyrone says, uh, Hamill, we should have got met for tacos uh, while you're in Cali. I won't be able to meet you with tacos this time, bud, but uh, I'll be in California a lot more uh, in the upcoming months, so we'll definitely meet up and go grab some. Um, why don't you uh, plan on taking uh, us down to uh, Baja for a pre-run and we'll eat some tacos down yeah, there? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, <laughs> how about we just go straight for tacos to yeah, Valley T? <laughs> exactly. That sounds like a good plan to me. Um, oh, and so Jeff Loth Lothringer said uh, late 90s that car was built. And I don't remember which car we were talking about, but 97, 98? Yeah, so Jeff Jeff had some time at Riviera Racing with that all-wheel drive car, so he knows he, he was there about that time when that car was built. So oh, he was knows, he? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and John Hupper said, uh, are you looking forward to the Peninsula run for next year's Baja 1000? So they've already scheduled it? Are they already yeah, well, it out? so usually Baja 1000s are every, th Peninsula runs are every third year. They used to a long time ago be every four years, and then it went to three. Sometimes it was every other year. But, um, yeah, I'm absolutely looking to a pen Peninsula run, especially after this year's Baja right. 1000, or Baja, yeah, the Baja 1000 slash 900. Um, you know, it took us, it took Luke 19 hours and 10 minutes or 11 minutes to win this year. Right. And uh, we were 1921. We can race from T, uh, from Ensenada La Paz faster than that. Right. And, uh, you know, this, this year's race, I discussed it earlier. It's so tight and twisty and technical. Yep. I really want to go do a peninsula run, gets, gets, uh, get some top speed going. And, and, uh, how big of a, he also asked how big of a crew do you have to have for a peninsula run? Well, la last time peninsula run, we were over a hundred people. Usually peninsula run, we're over a hundred. And the reason why, how I can explain that to you, why it's so many is all the fuel pits that we have, they're stationary right. and our fuel pits have anywhere from 10 to 18 people in them. Usually, usually I say there's about 15 people in each fuel pit and that's right. the Baja fools. Um, they have about 15 people in each one. So Baja 1000 will probably have six fuel stops. So that's yep. six times 15 that you get an idea there. And then uh, in the past years, um, 2014, we had three drivers, myself, Andy McMillan, and Jason Voss. Um, another Peninsula run. The last time we did a Peninsula run was myself, uh, Bean, Justin Smith, yep. and uh, Jason Voss. So we had three crews. And with that being said, I have chase crews that do the top third, the middle third, and the bottom third. Some of the guys at the beginning are my crew. They'll do the whole race, but, um, you know, that's how we get to over 100. There's probably 15 chase trucks, uh, six fuel pits, uh, airplane in the sky, Yep, 100 the, people. So, John, the logistical stuff behind any of those races is pretty phenomenal when you understand how it actually works because – 
there's so many people involved, but we just talked about it a little bit in the beginning of the show was like how many people actually have to be in the same mind frame as what he is behind the wheel and his co-driver is because they all have to kind of know if they don't have communication for a little bit, they have to make decisions about what each other are going to do. Like it's pretty phenomenal how these races actually go down. So anybody like Rob getting a second place in the Baja, winning the Baja, like all of these things are just phenomenal achievements. So you got to give kudos uh, to them for being able to do something like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Here we go. Uh, so we go from all of these uh, awesome things that you're doing, right, to I don't know if it was Carrie or Oren that commented in, but Off-Road Track and Trail says, hey, Rob, what is the best technique to putting on a catheter? Do you have a navigator help you? Oren. Yeah, o o Oren. Uh, Oren, yeah, or Oren and Carrie were on the yep. show a little bit ago. Yeah, yeah, Oren. <laughs> awesome people. Um, really enjoy or or Oren and Carrie. Um, Way or to throw out the hard questions. <laughs> it's like je Jeopardy right now. Yeah, or Oren's a character. <laughs> Oren was part of the Riviera team in 2007, my oh, first year. Yeah, Oren was one of the employees. He worked for Riviera. Great group of people. A lot of fun times. And and Oren is definitely uh, he's a uh, 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 instigator. He he. A lot of lot of <laughs> is, good times. A lot nice of good memories. Of say, nice way of saying. Oh, <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious, man. O Oren's a good people. Um, well, the easiest way to put it on is just get it on there and. Go to go to the go to get to the races in the starting line, and, man. and don't let it fall off. That's <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because then you're going to have some other stuff happen that nobody wants to know about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Tyrone. Uh, like I said, man, we'll get tacos soon. I'll be in California a lot more soon. Um, so. We kind of talked about a little bit about the what you guys are going to start doing in, in 2021 and stuff. Um, I want to get Caden on the show one of these days. Does yeah. he um, have any plans for 2021? Uh, right now he's going to race works in the pro classes. Um, oh, yeah, you had mentioned yep, the pro he's classes. For does sure that mean he's going to build another car? Well, he's for sure racing pro stock. And then, um, you know, he just started a new job this morning and had to get up and go to work at 5. So I don't know how that's going to work out for him. And, uh, you know, he, he has aspirations of going racing. So... Um, yeah, One of the coolest things that you told me that I thought was that was really neat, that, like I said before when we were talking, is a proud dad moment, is he really wants to do this on his own, man. Like, yeah. He really wants to pave his own path. Yeah, he's he's doing a good job doing everything on his own for the most part. You know, I try to help him out here and there, but he, he really, uh, really appears to want to do it on his own. You know, I support him at the races and um, try to help him in the shop when I can, and um, he's, he's had great success. I mean, Does what are the do keys most to of the stuff out of your guys? Place yeah. In, he, in he, Vegas? Yep. We have a, a 1500 square foot building on the side of my house and, um, he has his car in there and, and, uh, he preps it pretty much all himself. He does everything nice. there. And, and, uh, you know, one thing I realized about these kids today, they're coming up a lot of my, I I'm like, how do they get so good so quick? And I use the Serapis boys as an example is, you know, when they first started racing, you know, I was racing with their dad in the trophy truck. And then as they got a little bit old, they started in a, in, in a, Tro they did a little bit of trophy light. They did a little bit of um, uh, 6100. The um, they did a little bit of that, and then they stepped into 6100, and they were they did well. They won a lot of races. Then they got a trophy truck, and they're fast. And I realized, you know, with them, I realized they're listening. Yeah. They're paying attention. They're listening. They're watching videos. Yep. They're doing all this, so they already get the the race strategy and 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 pace. They all do that. And the same thing. I think Caden did the same thing. Yeah. I I you know being his dad. You know, I I would always say he's not listening to me, right. but hopefully he was listening and he's listening to other people. So I think that helps uh, these younger kids get through a lot of the stuff and, and figure stuff out quicker. Did he do any of the stuff like uh, I know, like every time I go to the Lucas races and stuff, uh, I always see uh, the little kids going up to say your pits, RJ's pits or whoever it is helping wash body panels yeah. and having a good time and doing all these fun things with Caden like that. When yeah. He yeah. He too? did that. You know, he would, uh, he'd bring his bicycle and you know, as I'm racing pro two, pro four, he's off and gone and I figure he's out playing in the sand or whatever. But you know, after I heard the stories, he's over at this guy's pit, helping him out and cleaning cars and, do and ever, doing stuff. So do you remember any of the kids that, uh, may have come up to you guys? Uh, well, one, don't want to call it back in the day, but, uh, a few years ago, like maybe a Sheldon Creed or a Jarrett Brooks that washed the panels and then like have fun with you. And now that you got to get to yeah. race against them. Yeah. I mean, you know, when these kids, I remember, you know, I, I didn't think much of it then, but right. when the Sheldons and Jarrett's and RJ's, when those guys were all little kids, yeah. like to me, they were little kids yeah, absolutely. and I never thought, I'm going to be racing these kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Exactly so, I'm so they're little kids. <laughs> and I never thought those little kids will never be racing me. Do you know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. then as time went on, all of a sudden those little kids were in pro lights and I still didn't think they're really going to be racing me. <laughs> and then they come into pro two and then they're racing me. Um, and Sheldon is someone, you know, he's one of the first guys 
uh, when when I would watch him drive, I'm like, damn, that kid's got talent. And when SST started, Robbie got him in a truck there. Yep. And I remember standing next to Robbie, and I, and I as Sheldon went by, and I watched him a little bit, and I knew Robbie was watching him. Sheldon went by, and I looked at Robbie, and I go, that's you yeah. right there. Yep. And, um, you know, Sheldon had an incredible talent. And uh, watching him um, in SST and then watching him in Pro Light, and then he got into Pro 2, he struggled a little bit there. And I remember one day, and I don't know how he crossed paths, but I knew his grandpa um, by name, Maurice. And, um, you know, we were passing by with each other, and we said something. I said, hey, you need to get that kid on asphalt as fast as you can. Yep. He can come back later and do this. Yep. But take him to asphalt now. And if he can't make it, you can come do this later. And, uh, man, it was awesome to see. I was watching Sheldon when he won the, the last race there, yeah. won the truck championship. And uh, it made me feel proud. Yeah. You know, same as Jimmy Johnson was a kid in Mickey Thompson. And, uh, you know, he his path, and I actually just saw, you know, a documentary on Jimmy after. And Jimmy said. Oh, I wanted to watch that. It yeah, good. it's good. It's good. And something Jimmy said in that was that he never stayed in one series for more than two years. So his, he moved really quick, Got you know, it. which is something to think about. Don't, you know, depending what your path is. And if you think you're, you know, you have aspiration to get into asphalt, NASCAR, IndyCar, try to get there as quick as you can. Don't pigeonhole don't, yourself. Yeah, exactly. Thing. Don't. And, um, you know, for me, I raced, I loved off-road so much. Like I, I almost want to say I set up home here doing this and by the time I got but the you opportunity also trickled yourself around different classes yeah so I did that a lot but you know I didn't have aspirations to go to asphalt really ever right. when the NAS I'll call it NAS truck when that started there was four off-road owners that each built two trucks a piece and I had and one of my Jim Venable was one of them who mm -hmm. I drove for so I had the opportunity right at the very beginning to do the NAS truck series and I did the first couple exhibition races was that like the Hornaday age yeah it was before him oh really before him so there was only in the very beginning there was off-road guys. There was no-name drivers. Myself, you know, Dave Ashley in, in the in the asphalt world. And uh, Hornaday came in after us. Uh, PJ Jones was probably the biggest oh, name okay, in, yeah. at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, But I only made it. I went to uh, the exhibition races, one at Mesa Marin, some, one up in Washington somewhere, I believe. Wasn't your and that's team. it. And I just didn't like it. I didn't like going in circles. And to me, these were, you know, these were ill-handling road cars <laughs> that you'd burn the tires off of them and then they were really bad hey so well, you're confirming with that uh, the dirt life is a good life <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i loved off-road you know i loved i'd done it for uh you know i'd already done it for at least 10 years i loved it i had a huge passion for it and i just didn't like asphalt so um you know i just made a commitment to do off-road my whole career well we're all thankful that you did that yeah. that's pretty cool i am uh, too mike gilson said uh how many year, more years of racing do you have in you well, good news. Walker made it all the way to his 60. Larry Raglan uh, still doing really well. Larry Rossler just won the Ball yeah. 1000. So Dude, Larry, phenomenal. Larry's, I don't want to call out his age, but I know he's at least 10 years older than me, or right about 10. Did so, uh, Well, I wonder how if we called him up and asked him how his body was feeling after the 1000. I think Larry's body was doing really good. Yeah. So Larry, you know, obviously he looks uh, he looks great. He uh, looks healthy. and He um, really does. Like, he looked like yeah. he was happy when he no, was No, absolutely. There, Larry, like, right I think home. He's, he's in a great place in life, I think. And uh, when in, he, he always makes a point of, um, and I know he's told it to me enough, that the number's 18. Yeah. And the number 18 is how many – Baja 1000 wins he has. Oh, wow. So I know because he's constantly telling me, yeah. you know, 17. Game, yeah, he'll go 18. <laughs> so anyways. That's a good one, though. So yeah. uh, that means you can't retire no. anytime soon. So uh, Special Ed says uh, we have a team to help uh, Havasu for the works races. So they're happy to help uh, yeah. Aiden, it sounds like. So uh, it sounds like you got a lot of support, man, if you need it. I know that you guys always have support on your guys' teams, but that's cool that people are chiming in saying that. Yeah. So uh, Jim Zinn said Caden uh, was Rob's tire spy at short course races. <laughs> oh, I see yeah. how it is. So you go in to wash panels for certain teams. Is yeah. that how it works? <laughs> yeah, Caden would uh, come back with uh, tire grooving tips from what yeah. other people were doing what what uh compound hey, carl's, tire carl's doing this <laughs> yeah. carl's doing that yeah <laughs> that's pretty funny i'm sure none of that happened all right uh you had a hand uh in the truck series what i don't know what that means yeah that's that's back to the nas truck so um, oh yeah 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 is that yeah mike montez yeah from vegas so yeah actually yeah we kind of talked about that just the beginning of the truck series and going to do that and um it's pretty cool did you did you ever think like it would be where it's at now? I mean, because like, there's so many 
different things that you're saying in these conversations that you may not pick up on because it was you that was doing them, but there's so many choices that you made. And we talked about this earlier again today. Yeah. When you make one choice, it equals all of these other yeah. things that happen, whether they're positive or negative. And it seems like a lot of the choices that you made made a positive difference for everybody in different industries. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, um, you know, when I made my decisions to go the direction I did, it's because that's what I wanted to do and I had yeah. passion towards it. So passion it, again. I, it, it, it worked. And because I had the passion, it, I made it work, yeah. if that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, so, um, you know, I guess, you know, I've been saying – Instead of so trying my, to shoehorn you into yeah, a, a payment. I've, I've been saying like, l- lately, life is what we make it, right? <laughs> so ultimately, you know, my success or, you know, and me being proud of what I've done or, or being um, good within my own skin of what I've done, it's because it's what I wanted to do. Absolutely. So so I'm I'm happy with it. I think that's those are words to live by, man. If we cut a clip out of this one is uh, passion and life is what you make it. I think those are very, very good words to live by. Uh Oh, and John is actually saying that uh, kids are running ARCA at like 15. I didn't think that was allowed. I thought ARCA was at an age restriction. Yeah, maybe, they made a change. I remember when uh, Kurt Busch or Kyle, remember Kyle was, yeah, he was trying to go to the right. truck series, yeah. and then they put they changed the the age. the age limit. So, Man, that's crazy. Yeah, well, kids are, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but to me, you know, kids are getting pretty damn good when they're young now, so I think it is okay. Or maybe they're more mature. What I don't know what it is. They're putting – putting something in the water dude it's just because we used to play uh ivan stewart off-road on the the video games like that now all the video games are realistic yeah. dude <laughs> yeah well you see these people with the simulators yeah. and all that stuff and have you tried one of those no i haven't i'm, dude, I'm reluctant because <laughs> i think I'll they get are addicted. really <laughs> difficult though yeah they are really difficult like i i thought i was like oh this is gonna be a video game i got this no problem and all of a sudden i got in there and i was all over the place yeah. man I'm just like it was crazy um let's see here so we had a couple more questions that uh, that I was actually going to ask you. And one of the ones was like, it was going to be like, what's your most memorable race? But I wanted to phrase it differently. It was like, what was the most memorable time that you had during your racing career? Like uh, eating tacos at Valley Tea, I mean, with yeah. a bunch of family. You mentioned uh, your mom. Like, what are some of these things that are really emotional that you are really happy that you got to do over the years? Yeah, I mean, um, ultimately, you know, running your own team and uh, being successful has been probably one of the things I look back on and I appreciate the most. Um, Because you you understand what went into it? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, thankfully I've got, you know, people that that surround me, you know, Amber being one of my girlfriend, um, you know, helping uh, put together the Baja 1000 wins and all the goes into the logistics of that. And uh, in hindsight, looking back, and realizing how much work and effort went into everything that we've done and support and support everything that we've done since 2013 and, and realizing, you know, all everything behind the scenes, you know, Peninsula runs a hundred people, you know, how many different, uh, hotel reservations that is, you know, how many hotels, how many it's different cities, crazy, right? you know, how many people, where do you put them all? Where do they go? You know, what direction did they all what make they it eat? down? <laughs> you know, what, what are they, you know, exactly you know what what are their what are their needs you know yeah. when can Allergy, they go when they go home yeah, allergies yeah. you know ambers she's done stuff you know uh you know dog tags for every single person on the team in case there's an emergency so knowing cool. you know just everything but um knowing all the work and effort that's gone into uh, even one race one one whether it's san felipe the ball 1000 whether it's a race in the states whatever it is all the work that goes into that and then being successful on the other end, winning yeah. a championship or winning the race and looking back at it and knowing that it came to fruition oh, yep. and what, what you did and what your group did, you know, and that's the thing, I guess, you know, I, I come to this realization in the last year or so, to me, more than any race, that's what means the most. It's the group of the people that were put together, assembled and did a task or multiple tasks, and it all came out on the other end being successful. Yeah, and I well, and I, I agree with all of that, it, even on the non-successful days, actually, too. That's a true statement. I love that answer because that's the exact reason that we started this show is because of all the camaraderie in the off-road industry. And I don't know if it's the same in pavement racing and stuff like that because I've never done that, so I yeah. wouldn't know. But 
those are the exact same things that I remember from my dirt bike racing tenure, from uh, my little short course racing tenure in UTVs, and now being on the media side of it, I see it directly with every single team, whether it's the little mom pop team with the 570 Razor all the way up to a trophy yep. truck team. Like, it's phenomenal to see all of that stuff, man. Um, all right, well, we're going to kind of wind things down a little bit here. Um, we're going to do a rapid-fire Q&A, but before we do that um, – I know that you kind of just went into it, but who are the people that you do um, have on your team that you'd like to thank before we start getting the rapid fire? Yeah, well, first and foremost, you know, Amber. Yeah. Um, you know, she's at my right hand. She's does tons of things for the team, constantly managing all the people, talking to them, keeping everybody. Yeah, she's, she's like making the group. everybody laugh, man. We're at that work yeah. fighter thing. She was saying some funny yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, no, she's definitely a hard worker. Um, you awesome. know, Cheryl. His son, Andy, has been here helping lately with the trophy truck. Um, Lachero's done awesome with this thing, prepping it. He's got, you know, uh, very good success with that. All the Baja Fools, the Chase guys, the Braza guys, the Lothringer guys, uh, Jamie Campbell, he used to help pit us. Um, man, yeah, there's just so, so many congratulations people. Congratulations again, Jamie. Yep, Jimmy Davidson, who spoke up today. He used to work for us, prep the Pro 4, work for us at Menzies as well, and he's awesome and incredible talent. And, uh, you know, all those people – you know, that, that, um, that are out there that have put their time in Jimbo, you know, it's great having a lot of people that have been in my career working for teams that I've been with over the time. Um, it's, it's incredible the, all those people's help made my success happen. Yeah. 100%. And, what and is it? The uh, teamwork makes a dream. Work exactly. Kind of and then I couldn't do it alone. There's, you know, I, there's no way it's, it's with all these people and them taking time away from their families, um, their, their kids, Things like that. Um, Some of the pictures that we had up on the intro screen, too, were pretty cool, too, because, uh, and I've seen you do this many times at the races, you genuinely appreciate the fans. Like, you'll stop whatever you're doing, even if it's important to your race day or whatever, and go pay attention to what they're doing because they mean so much to you and to the racing organizations in general. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you know, those fans have passion, too. And, um, you know, especially little kids and, uh, you know, a neat story that I have is when I first started going to Baja, um, being down in San Ignacio at staying at the La Pinta Hotel, that's what it was named back in the day, and having the waiter bring his little baby son that was just born within six months ago in to introduce really? him to us. And four years later, the next Peninsula run, he brings his four-year-old in. Four years later, he brings his eight-year-old in four or three years later so every time we keep seeing this little boy grow 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 really? pretty soon you go in there to that restaurant four years later pre-running where's your son oh he went to college in la paz and then be down in la paz at the finish line and have the boy the now it's a young man come up tap you on the shoulder and go remember me and it's like not sure and he That's goes my dad san ignacio the waiter like holy, holy shit smoke. so it's you uh, things like that, you know, in Cranon, Dude, a lot of the same things. That's like a movie. Yep, same thing in Cranon. About. You got people, kids that came there when I raced there in the early 90s, and, and now they're there today. You know, Mikey Gilson was 14, and now he's 30-something. That is so. so cool, man. I love stories like that. You must have so many of those stories, too, man. It's so cool. We couldn't even, I mean, even if we stayed on this uh, on this interview for the next two days, we couldn't uh, have enough fun with Rob. But uh, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or to Rob on uh, Instagram. Both of us will try to get back to you if we possibly can. Um, his is at 21RobMac on Instagram, and mine is, uh, or ours is, at the Dirt Life Show on Instagram. All right, bud, you ready for a rapid-fire Q&A? Sure. All right, let's do it. Dunes or the river? Both. <laughs> you want to go both? Well, now, lately it's been the river. Amber's a, Amber's a river girl, so. She wants to do the river? The river. I like the river. Okay, cool. So uh, what kind of stuff do you do with the river? Are you a boater guy or are you a jet um, ski guy? I like driving the boat, pulling people, throwing them off the tube, and then yeah. relax on the beach. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Amber like, likes throwing me off the tube, though. That's another good story. That's Oh, really? Did yeah. she get you good ones? Oh, she was pinned. Like, the boat, like, like I'm towing, the boat's going, like, 35, 40. So were you swinging oh, out, like? Swinging out and then flying and then skipping, <laughs> all that. How fast is the boat going? She goes, I don't know. And then later I find out it's going, like, almost 50. Yeah, and what is it? You're, like, going, like, double or triple speed on, oh, the, it was, on the road? Oh, it was good. Yeah, she was trying to kill me. <laughs> Did you do something bad the week earlier? <laughs> Probably. Uh, Three-wheelers or quads? 
uh, I rode three wheelers. I rode quads. So now I I still own my uh, I have a Yamaha Banshee. I still own. No way. We yeah. were talking about Banshees the other day. Alfonso actually just yeah. got rid of his. Yeah, I still own mine. I bought it in '88. Did you uh, get a Tumi kit? Uh, no. You know the exhaust yeah, kit? I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I have FMF pipes. Oh yeah, I, I know a bunch of people who got yeah. those because the FMF made those nickel plated ones. Yeah. Nobody wanted to clean their pipes. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's what I got. Um, still you, runs too. Really? It starts like in you put if it has fresh gas, it's like one kick. It's in an idles all day long. Uh, that's the best so part about it. the Banshees is like it was those three fifty twins, so it barely took any pressure. Like yeah. you wouldn't get any of that what's it called kickback or whatever yeah. on the on the Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you said you do pay attention to motocross, Cincerillo or Osborne? Ooh, uh, Osborne. You're going Osborne? Yeah, I like both. I mean Cincerello, uh just you know, the couple times when he kind of crashed and threw championships away. What about kinda. let's see, uh, Barsha or Webb? Um, that new man. gas gas team. I don't yeah, know. He's all fired up. Yeah. We, uh, so future. Yeah, I don't know. I like Bam Bam. He it's he's pretty amazing. Cooper's they're they're both good. I like I like 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 I said earlier on about a team. I I don't have a favorite team. I like a a good game. Yeah. You know what good I mean? Battle. And I guess. Ultimately, I like someone with good strategy, runs a good race, and and. Uh, I feel like Cooper Webb would be like uh, more of a Rob McCacken mindset because he's got such good racecraft. Yeah, no, he 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 was impressive the year he won the championship. You know, obviously, you know, I think you know he worked hard, did good. Things fell his way too, which that's what happens when you win a lot of races, win a championship. Things go but your you way. You could see him. Th- yeah, no, he was like smart. future thinking in those races. Yeah. like he'd see lines come in yep. before anybody else, like yeah. all that stuff. No, he did. I I enjoyed him his championship season. That's for sure. All right, let's get into some simpler questions. Little Smokies or pizza rolls? Pizza. Pizza rolls. Uh, coffee or tea? Tea. Favorite soda? We already know this one. It's Mountain Dew lately. Yeah, <laughs> you you gotta try those white man margaritas, dude. Um, oh. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Like you're gonna fly, you're gonna be an invisible fly. guy. Probably fly. Flying would be pretty cool. So we had I forgot who said it, Ronnie Anderson maybe. Um tele teleportation, is that how you say yeah. it? Yeah. Teleport. Yeah. So yeah. that way you don't have to drive anymore. Yeah. You that's just true. go wherever. Yeah, that's that's good. I don't I don't I, th- I think I don't think I wanna be invisible. Yeah, I don't think either. Yeah. Cause then you like what if you can't control it one yeah. day or something? Uh Uggs or Crocs. Mm. My feet are cold now, so I'll go with the Uggs. You going Uggs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we kind of asked this one. Uh, most memorable race? I like Ba 1000, Crandon, short course. Yeah, those. Yeah. Yep. Those are, and I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, well, maybe I'm being a little presumptuous here, but because you have so many people around you at those races. Yeah. Like, it probably feels different, right? It feels yeah. like a little bit more heartfelt. True. Yeah. So, um, favorite flavor of ice cream? Um, gosh, lately it's been vanilla. Really? <laughs> it's in the fridge. All right. Apple so pie and vanilla. We both uh, we both know Robert Blanton, <laughs> and uh, I promised him that I would try to give him as many jabs as possible because he answered strawberry rendezvous. One time. <laughs> so I was like, strawberry. Let's rendez- go. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, how can such a badass answer strawberry rendezvous? Right? Like, <laughs> uh, dogs or cats? Dogs. Uh, Netflix or YouTube? YouTube. Uh, yeah, I've been getting into a lot more YouTube these days, too, man. It seems like, because YouTube, you can just pick whatever you want, right? Um, ooh, that might be a, a good thing to do. Maybe we'll see Rob Cackran come out with a cool YouTube video in 2021, huh? Uh, burrito or taco? Tacos. Supercross or motocross? Super. You're going supercross? I thought uh, you like desert racing. You like the gnarliness of motocross. Yeah. I know, supercross... Well, for me, I guess Supercross at the beginning of the year, you got all the players. By the end of Supercross, you don't have all the players, and usually in Motocross, you don't have all the players. You have to, dude. <laughs> so I like the beginning of the season of Supercross because, holy shit, yeah. the competition is there. It's stacked. So, so it's, And I, that's what I kind of wonder how it's going to be this year in 2021 because, like, Anaheim 1 is always, like, oh, my, it's like – Going to the starting line at the bottom, yeah. like nobody knows because they've been preparing for a yeah. year for it. It's like holy shit, yeah. man! The level is stacked. Um, well, if we're just asking that Supercross or Motocross question, this is not a question that's on my list. But what would you rather do if you had one race weekend? Go race a desert race or go race a short course race? And let's just use Crandon and Baja as the as the two. So Crandon or Baja? I'd go to Baja because it lasts longer. And tacos. <laughs> and tacos. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, 
what other form of racing would you like to try? And oh, wait, I, this is always prefaced. So it could be anything. Offshore boats, F1, monster trucks. It could even be lawnmowers for all that we care. Uh, I think, the, you know, feeling what a F1 car would do would be pretty incredible. It would be pretty incredible. Whether it's driving it or riding in one. Because I don't know if I'd ever get the opportunity to drive one, but I riding even, one would it would be incredible. <laughs> I think so, too. And I thought to myself, like, when I was thinking, like, okay, driving a, an F1 car would be fantastic. I was like, you know what? Just going and seeing yeah. how those things get on the track yep. would be phenomenal. Absolutely. I wonder if you could transfer anything like that into off-road. The money you could. Yeah, I guess you could, <laughs> right? Um, all right. The last most important question of the night. I feel like I already have your answer, but uh, chips and guacamole or french fries and ranch? Ooh, I like chips and guacamole. Yeah, same here. Uh, well, thank you very much, dude, for joining us. I really appreciate it. It was awesome that you, uh, you know, let us come into the shop and hang out for a little bit and stay late with us. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank it you was, for having me. It was awesome. So, uh, yeah, man, hopefully uh, 2021 goes good for you, and we're all going to be cheering you on. Yep, 21 is my number, short course number. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. So it should huh? be good. <laughs> yeah, that should be good. What, I wanted to ask you, what was the reason you picked 21? Uh, let's see. Probably, uh, I'm pretty sure I was number 21 in basketball. Oh, and then uh, when I started racing short course with my own team in 97, we were 421 because uh, it was a pro four, so the numbers were 421. Right. And then, um, you know, when I raced uh, trophy truck, I believe I was 21 the last uh, year. And then when I had the choice in, in short course, we, so we picked it. 21. Did yep. you have 21 on any of your motorcycles? Uh, no. No. No? I don't even remember those numbers. I remember a 113. Please tell me it wasn't 007, dude. <laughs> no. I think it was 113. That's the only rem That's one I think I remember. Oh, man. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much to uh, all you guys for joining us tonight. You guys have done, and Jeff Wolf says thank you as well, Rob. Uh, yeah, you. He, they say you do good at dirt oval racing. Well, we know he likes it in the dirt, so yeah. we'll see. Uh, oh, actually, these are actually some pretty good questions. So uh, let's actually answer these real quick. Uh, let's see. Rob said, uh, or excuse me, Mike said, Rob would be good at dirt oval racing. Come on, computer. Uh, is there anything you dislike about driving your race truck? Mm, no. <laughs> uh, your family is super proud of you. Yeah, that's awesome that you guys said that. Everybody else is saying thanks, Rob. Uh, if racing is your work, what do you like to do as a hobby? Race. Yeah. That's my, <laughs> my, I'm lucky. My, uh, my passion, my hobby, my job, my career Everything is racing. Okay, so we were so, talking about little kids and racing and stuff. Have you ever raced little RC cars? Uh, I did a little bit. Did yep. you? Yeah, yeah. Were I you don't. any good at it? Because it's way different than racing at home. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, in the beginning, uh, I, was, I was not that good because I would be impatient. As soon as I'd crash once, then I'd, it, everything would fly out the window. Yeah, exactly. And I'd just get worse. Yep. So um, uh, mid-'80s, I started doing slot cars. You ever, you ever seen that? little tiny Little ones? slot cars. Yeah. You race on a track. It's usually about eight lanes wide. It's so, all about throttle control, Yeah, exactly. Right? So in the, in the 80s, and that's something I'd recommend to people, um, mid-'80s or so, I started doing that, racing uh, slot cars. And uh, I'll tell you what, that really got your concentrate – focus and concentration it's so level. quick too yeah you're super fast and you got eight of them and if you crash you know you're you're falling behind yep. so um i know you know i used i use that a little bit what i learned in slot cars i use today still. that's really really cool yeah and the reason i asked that question i wanted to ask it before was because um i had a bad accident i hit my head and i got my brain scrambled and still my eyes don't work that well but one of the forms of therapy that i used was driving the little rc car around i yeah. would i wasn't even racing it or anything i was just trying to control it in the street right it was phenomenal how much focus and concentration you had yeah. to have from that and it turns into like i want to make it set up better and I want to make it handle better. And then it all goes back to like what you're doing with a big truck. Cause yeah. you know how to set it up, you know how to make it handle. It's pretty cool that you notice that same stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us. We really uh, appreciate it. Oh, look, see, we even got people talking in Spanish, Alfonso. So um, Merry Christmas to you guys as well. Uh, thank you, Rob Mack from Jim's Inn. Um, well, thank you very much to all of, all of you guys. Thank you very much to our sponsors. We really appreciate it. Like I said before, at the beginning of the show, you can uh, go to the shock therapy uh, guys, give them a call, Mitch and uh, the guys over there, or excuse me, uh, Milo and JT over there, you can call them up, say the Dirt Life sent you, uh, shocktherapist.com, and use the code Dirt Life. Uh, thank you to the guys at KMC Wheels. Obviously, Rob wants to thank the guys at Vision Wheels, BF Goodrich, and uh, Makita. You got anybody else on there? Yeah, just uh, Fox Shocks, Casey Lights, 
um, VP Fuels, everyone that supports me. Thank you guys very much, and more success coming. Yeah, more success coming, and definitely um, some of the cool ideas that Rob has, man. I can't wait to see if these come to fruition if he does. Uh, like I said, thank you guys at KMC Wheels, Ryan, and uh, Ryan over at EFX Tires, too. Um, like I said, we have a giveaway side-by-side, -side, guys, uh, on Instagram. You can go look at that giveaway. You can win some KMC Wheels for your UTV. Thank you very much to the guys at Zollinger Racing Products. You can use the code DIRTLIFE at ZollingerRacingProducts.com. Uh, thank you to the guys at Cryo Heat, man. They've been just doing so much awesome stuff with uh, the UTV improvements. And just everybody that's on board with us is making huge leaps and making the UTV industry grow. Uh, thank you very much to the guys at SolderWeld for providing all their products and their off-road repair kit. You can use the code DIRTLIFE over at SolderWeld.com and uh, save a whole bunch of money on your off-road repair kit. Uh, next week's show, man, it's going to be really cool. We uh, we aren't going to be in uh, a shop, but uh, we're going to have Pleasant Cook, 4x4 Barbie, on the show. So that'll be a cool... Uh, uh, departure from the racing thing because she does some really cool stuff and uh, uh, she's just going to be awesome to talk to. So, uh, like I said, thank you very much. Thank you, Alfonso, for helping us set it up. And uh, you're a good co host and interviewee, man. I appreciate it, Rob. Right on. So, all right. Well, thank you guys very much. Thanks, Rob. We'll see you guys later. Have a good night. We love you. Thanks for listening to the Dirt Life Show.